Hachette Audio presents Ever After High, Fairies Got Talent. Written by Suzanne Selfors. Read by Kathleen McInerney. For Alexa and Alyssa, who magically appeared in my life as if transported by fairy dust. Chapter 1 Wings and Things What's a carrot doing inside my shoe? Faybel Thorne, daughter of the notoriously wicked Dark Fairy, turned her high top sneaker upside down. A half eaten carrot fell out and landed on the plush carpet. The corner of Faybel's lip curled in annoyance. I certainly didn't put it there. Oops! Sorry. That familiar response came from Fabel's roommate, Bunny Blanc, daughter of the famously late White Rabbit. Bunny had the annoying habit of munching on carrots while working on her throne work. Without looking up from her mirror pad or her hexed book, she tossed the carrot tops at the compost bin, but they'd often end up in other places. Yesterday, Fabel had found one in her sock drawer. I don't know how you can stand eating those things all the time, Fabel said as she laced up her shoe. Carrots are delicious, Bunny told her. She collected the carrot top and dumped it into the bin. Then she grabbed her book bag and scurried toward the door. You know what I think is delicious? Fabel asked, a cool tone in her voice. Bunny stopped in her tracks and spun around. Turnips? Cabbage? Beanstalk roots? Fabel raised a single eyebrow. I think dark magic is delicious. Bunny's eyes widened. Her gaze darted to the wall, to a painting of the Thorn family crest. In the center of the crest, the motto, Doers of Dark Magic, wrapped around an evil-looking eye that seemed to follow Bunny, no matter where she stood in the room. The painting was intimidating to some and inspirational to others, depending on what side of the magical world one stood. You can't eat dark magic, Bunny said, though she didn't sound entirely convinced. A dark fairy can do whatever she pleases with dark magic, Fabel coolly informed her. Bunny's nose twitched. It thrilled Fabel to see that her little dark magic comment had stirred uncertainty in her roommate. Of course, Fabel would never use dark magic to hurt Bunny or any other student at Ever After High. Causing harm to others could get her expelled. While at school, it was best to follow the headmaster's rules, or at the very least, appear to be doing so. But every once in a while, a reminder was needed. Fabel was no ordinary student, and that fact should never be forgotten, not by her roommate, not by anyone. Fabel's mother was the dark fairy, the one who hadn't been invited to the celebration after Sleeping Beauty was born, and thus had cursed Sleeping Beauty to sleep for one hundred years. The dark fairy was royalty in the fairy world and it was Fabel's destiny to one day wear her mother's crown and become the most villainous of all fairies. It was, in Fabel's opinion, a glorious destiny, and it filled her with pride. So, as she looked at her Wonderland roommate, she smiled most wickedly. In the future, I suggest you keep your veggie snacks on your side of the room. Her eyes blazed, and both beds rose off the floor, just a little reminder of her magical powers. Sure, okay, Bunny gulped. You're right, I've been kind of messy. Oh dear, is that the correct time? I'm going to be late for a very important date. And off she went, as quickly as she could. Who could blame her for wanting to make her escape? Rooming with the daughter of the darkest of dark fairies was a bit unsettling at times. Bark, bark. 
Fabel reached down and scooped a small fluff ball into her arms. The creature was a wiggling, wagging, wet-nosed, pom-pomeranian puppy named Spindle. These were the moments when Fabel allowed her icy exterior to melt, for she loved Spindle with all her heart. This might have surprised some, but being a villain did not mean that Fabel was incapable of love. Quite the opposite. Fabel felt things deeply, and she loved her family with the ferocity of a fairy. Fairy hearts might be smaller than human hearts, but they beat with a rhythm that is powered by magic. Fairies are capable of love without measure. But so too are they capable of the darker emotions, also without measure. She kissed Spindle's head, hugged him, and laughed when he licked her cheeks. That's enough, little one, she said tenderly. I've got to finish getting dressed. It's a busy day, as usual. She set him on her bed. He stretched onto his tummy, watching while Fabel finished tying her sneakers. Shoes in place, Fabel walked over to her vanity, carefully stepping over a turnip top along the way. Aside from Bunny's tedious habit of eating raw vegetables, there was nothing wrong with Bunny. But Fabel couldn't understand why the headmaster had chosen such a weird pairing for roommates. Why not select someone who, at the very least, was part of Fabel's story? Like Briar Beauty, who Fabel would someday curse to fall into a deep sleep for a hundred years. Or if not a character from her story, why not choose another villain's daughter, like Lizzie Hartz or Gingerbread House? Or even better, why not another fairy? At least a fairy wouldn't have a stupid collection of Wonderland teacups. A fairy wouldn't gnaw on roots and tubers. And a fairy would understand the importance of wing care. If I ran this school, things would be Totally different, Fabel mused. She'd have an entire floor of the dormitory all to herself, as a future ruler rightfully deserves. Once she took her place as the dark fairy, she'd come back to Ever After High and change things. That will be a glorious day. But in the meantime, she had other things to tend to like her duties as the cheer-hexing squad captain. Today was a very important day for her team. They would begin to learn a new routine for the regional tournament next month, where all the high schools in the Fable districts would compete for the title of cheer-hexing champions. Before Fabel rose to the ranks of captain, the Ever After High cheer-hexers had a losing streak that spanned generations. Fabel was determined to bring home the golden trophy and place it in the trophy case in the Ever After High Grimnasium. Fabel stood in front of her mirror. She pulled her shimmering blonde hair into a high ponytail and chose a headband with a thorn ornament to hold her teal bangs in place. She inspected her reflection to make sure she hadn't forgotten anything. Her cheer-hexing uniform included a shimmering skirt, a t-shirt with the letters E-A-H, and midnight blue leggings. The pom-poms were already tucked into her equipment bag. There was only one thing more to do. She unfolded her wings. Fairy wings are unique in the winged world neither made of feathers like a bird's wings, nor stretched skin like a bat's. They are more akin to butterfly wings. Each wing is made of overlapping sections that are ultra thin. When light shines through, the sections act like prisms, casting brilliant colors and sometimes even rainbows. When not in use, the wings are folded and flattened against the back. Fairy clothing was tailored to include wing holes. Fabel's wings were so iridescent, they complemented any outfit she chose. Fabel glanced out the dormitory window. The morning was pleasantly sunny, 
the sky as blue as the icing on a throne cake. A perfect day for practice. She searched through the bottles, perfumes, and cosmetics on her vanity. She used many products to keep her wings healthy. After showering, she'd treat them with a leave-on conditioner to keep them glossy and supple. Oh, there it is, she said as she grabbed a bottle. Then she reached over each shoulder and spritzed her wingtips with sunscreen. Always be proud of your wings, her mother had often told her. They set you apart from the rest of the fairy tale world. They are the symbol that you, my darling daughter, are made of magic. I certainly am, Fabel thought. With a satisfied smirk, she tucked Spindle in the crook of her arm and headed out to begin what she hoped would be another villainous day. And she made sure that her wings were proudly displayed for all to see. Chapter Two, A Fairy Fitting. It was during her early childhood when Fabel learned that her wings were all important. Being raised in a fairy household, wings were a constant topic of conversation, the center of style, and the object of legends. There were paintings of wings and winged sculptures. Even their mailbox was shaped like a wing. The mailbox stood at the end of the long driveway and read Thorn Residence. It contained the usual stuff, catalogs, bills, and junk mail. But it also contained handwritten letters, mostly from young fairies, boys and girls, who hoped to one day meet the mailbox's owner, the Dark Fairy, a.k.a. Madame Thorn. However, while the mailbox was stuffed to capacity, there was a certain type of correspondence that never appeared at the Thorn residence invitations. Whether the event was a wedding, a birthday, or a reunion did not matter. It was the dark fairy's curse to never get invited to things. She went to a great deal of effort spying and eavesdropping, for it was important that she be seen at the most prestigious events. But if she stumbled upon a party in progress that had eluded her detection, she'd go into a rage. It made sense, then, that it was best to invite the dark fairy so as not to feel her wrath. But whether they intended to invite her or not, everyone forgot to invite her. That was the curse. Invitations were a sensitive subject in the Thorn household. A guardhouse stood next to the mailbox with a goblin in attendance. It was his duty to inspect documents and identifications before allowing entrance through the silver gates. One might assume that the dark fairy's driveway would lead to an eerie residence, a gargoyle-infested fortress or a crumbling, bat-filled castle, especially because it was located in the dark forest. But the villa at the end of the driveway was of elegant design and built of white stone. Marble steps led to a pair of French doors, flanked on either side by tall windows that sparkled in the sunlight. A perfectly manicured lawn, sculpted hedges, and a shimmering koi pond lent an air of sophistication and impeccable taste. The dark fairy herself did not look as one might expect, either. She did not shroud herself in midnight black or blood red, nor did she wear a mask or a cape. She kept no spiders, snakes, or rats at her beck and call, nor did she slink among shadows. Her floor-to-ceiling portrait graced the wall opposite the main entry. In this painting, her white hair was swept to the side, exposing a long, pale neck. Her dress was white silk with pearl buttons, and her heels were formed from elvish crystal. She looked the purest example of couture elegance, and upon her folded hands perched a single ring bearing the Thorn family crest. 
At first glance, one might think that her lack of embellishment was a sign that she was simple. But the painter had captured the truth in her dark eyes. She was an intelligent, complex being who knew the power of destiny. Behind the portrait, up the winding staircase, third door on the right, was Fabel's childhood room. This was a happy place, cluttered with stuffed animals, building blocks, crayons, and paper. All manner of things to keep Fabel busy, for she had been an active, quick-witted child who hadn't cared for idle time. Her personal understanding of wings occurred three days after her sixth birthday, when she was getting dressed in her room. But she was having trouble. It doesn't fit, she complained, her voice muffled by the pink shirt she was trying to yank over her head. Her chambermaid, a mouse-sized fairy named Lucille, flew around Fabel's waist, then tugged on the shirt's hem. The shirt wouldn't budge. Your wings are in the way, Lucille declared. My wings? Fabel took off the shirt, then turned sideways and looked in a mirror. Sure enough, while she'd slept, her baby wings had tripled in size. She nearly burst with happiness. They're so pretty. My wings grew. <laughs> they grew. Unaccustomed to the new size, she unfurled them without warning, accidentally knocking tiny Lucille across the room. Then Fabel flapped her wings and rose right up to the ceiling. Wow, look what I can do. After ricocheting off the wall, Lucille landed face first on a stuffed unicorn. She scrambled to her feet and shook a finger at Fabel. You come down here this instant, young lady. Fabel did, but she flew right back up, up and down, up and down, laughing the whole time. Her baby wings had never lifted her more than a few inches off the ground. I can't wait to show mother. Well, you can't show anyone until you get dressed. Using a miniature pair of scissors, Lucille enlarged the wing holes in Fabel's shirt. It still didn't fit perfectly, but at least her wings were comfortable. Hurry up, Fabel said, wiggling while the chambermaid selected a pair of shoes. Won't mother be surprised? Madam already knows that your wings have grown, Lucille told her. How does she know? Fabel had only been out of bed for a short time. She hadn't yet seen her mother. Because the entire household can hear you shouting, Lucille told her. You shouldn't shout. But my wings grew. While Fabel danced around the room, Lucille flew after her, doing her best to brush Fabel's messy white blonde hair. Dear, oh dear, you are a handful. She zipped around Fabel's head, trying to get the locks to settle into place. But each time she'd smooth a section of hair, Fabel would spin around and mess the whole thing up. With an exasperated sigh, Lucille pushed Fabel toward the door. Out you go. Then she escorted Fabel downstairs, through the grand entry, and on to the circular driveway where the Thorne family's driver was waiting by a black stretch limousine. Its hood ornament was a pair of wings. Good morning, Ms. Thorne, he said with a tip of his cap. His wings were as black as his suit, but the tips looked as if they'd been dipped in liquid silver. He opened the limo's back door. Are you ready for an adventure? Are we going somewhere? Aren't we flying? Fabel asked. I can fly high now. My wings grew. Wanna see? She lifted off the ground, higher than she'd expected. The sensation startled her, and she squeaked with alarm. The driver reached up and gently grabbed her ankle. I am impressed, he told her as he pulled her back to the ground. But we won't be flying today, because the weather is questionable. 
we wouldn't want you and your new wings to get caught in a rainstorm. Where are we going? Fabel asked. That is a surprise, Lucille told her. She gently pushed Fabel into the limousine's back seat, but she didn't join her. Aren't you coming with me? Fabel asked. Lucille hovered outside the car's door, her minuscule wings beating the air. Madam will accompany you today, she said. Fabel gasped. Whatever they were doing, it had to be super important if her mother was coming along. No suitcases had been packed, so they must not be going far. But the dark fairy rarely went on errands, and Fabel hadn't been told to dress for one of those parties where they always showed up uninvited. She squirmed, watching out the window for her mother to appear. A few minutes later, the dark fairy flew out of the villa. She wore an elegant silver suit. Her white hair was tucked beneath a pillbox hat. Hello, darling, she said, as she slid into the limousine and settled next to her daughter. Mother! Fabel wrapped her arms around the dark fairy and took a deep breath. The delicate scent of roses wafted from the nape of her mother's neck. It was a well-chosen scent, for though roses smell sweet, they also have thorns. The driver closed the door. Lucille waved goodbye as the limousine made its way down the long driveway. Fabel stopped hugging her mother, then pressed her face against the limousine's window. Where are we going? She asked. She waved to the goblin guard as he opened the gate. Your wings have begun to grow, the dark fairy said with a proud glint in her eye. And they will keep growing until you reach adulthood. Therefore, the time has come for you to meet my tailor. From this moment forth, he will customize all your clothing to fit your wings perfectly. New clothes? Fabel scowled. That didn't sound like an adventure. Couldn't we go to the beast garden or go get rainbow cones? Madame Thorne took her daughter's hand and stared into her equally dark, equally complex eyes. This is important, she said. Trust me. The journey to Fairy Town took an hour, during which Fabel wiggled and squirmed like a captive caterpillar in a jar. But finally, the colorful buildings rose into view. The driver turned down Main Street, passing shops and cafes. Sidewalks bustled with both winged and non-winged individuals. Some carried packages, some walked dogs. Others gazed at window displays. Because of the large ferry population, there was additional traffic in the air and extra seating on the roofs for those who wanted to sip nectar with a breathtaking view. The limousine pulled to the curb and stopped. When the driver opened the back door, Fabel darted out and stood on the sidewalk. No one paid much attention to her. A pair of fairies flew around her. A man with a phoenix on his shoulder didn't even bat an eye. A lady nearly bumped into Fabel with her baby carriage. Am I invisible? Fabel thought. Don't they see that my wings grew? She flicked them, once, twice. Look at me. Suddenly, everyone stopped walking, stopped talking, and all eyes turned and stared. But they weren't looking at Fabel's wings. The dark fairy had emerged from the limousine. Her height was impressive, even more so in her crystal stilettos. She smoothed the wrinkles from her skirt and made sure her hat was perfectly in place. Then, with her chin high, she unfurled her wings. A collective, oh, filled the street. They were magnificent wings, powerful and delicate at the same time. As translucent as glass, but with black edging, as if they'd been drawn in the air with a marker. For a moment, the rain clouds parted. 
The dark fairy turned slightly, allowing her wings to catch the sunlight. A rainbow fell across the limousine. Ah, the crowd said. Those standing closest bowed their heads. Madam, they whispered. Then the dark fairy bent down and whispered in her daughter's ear, follow me, hold your head high, and do not make eye contact with anyone. Let them stare at you. Let them admire you. The gawkers stepped back as the dark fairy's wings began to flap. She rose a few inches off the ground, then flew toward a shop. Fabel followed. She did her best not to look at anyone, but there was so much to see. There was a leprechaun with a mohawk, a lady with goat ears, and that phoenix was adorable. The dark fairy stopped outside a shop. A sign hung above the door. Fairy fashion and finery. The driver hurried forward and opened the shop's door. But at that exact moment, another fairy exited the shop. She was roundish in shape, wearing a simple cotton dress and casual shoes. Her blue hair was up in a bun. Her wings were blue at the tips, but they were folded. She'd chosen to walk out of the shop. Oh, pardon me, she said with a little gasp, her hand flying to her chest as she nearly bumped into the dark fairy. Then she curtsied. It is an honor to see you again, madam. The dark fairy said nothing, but her gaze could have melted stone. The blue-haired fairy stepped aside, making room as the dark fairy flew into the store. Fabel then noticed a little girl who was holding the fairy's hand. The girl also had blue hair. Their eyes met. The little girl smiled. Fabel smiled back. They were the same height, maybe even the same age. My wings grew, Fabel told her. The blue haired girl nodded. Mine did too. Fabel, the dark fairy called sternly. Fabel darted inside. The fairy fashion and finery store was warm and quiet. There were no other customers, just a man with a pointed silver beard who'd been writing in a ledger. But when he turned around and saw the dark fairy hovering in his shop, he dropped his feather pen. Then he bowed. Madam, to what do we owe this unexpected pleasure? His hands began to tremble. It is time for my daughter's first fitting, the dark fairy told him. She flew to a leather chair, then sat. She folded her hands on her lap. Well, she asked with a hint of irritation. Yes, yes, uh, of course. The tailor grabbed a measuring tape. The daughter of Madame Thorne is always welcome in my humble shop. It is an honor to serve you. He didn't look honored. His legs shook and his face had gone a bit blotchy. As his fingers fumbled, he dropped the tape. I do apologize for my clumsiness, he mumbled. Fabel didn't like having to stand perfectly still and be measured. She didn't much care about the fabrics or the type of thread or whether buttons or zippers were selected. However, she did enjoy all the attention she was getting as townsfolk stood outside the window whispering and watching the proceedings. For a moment, Fabel felt famous. But then she wondered, what was the blue-haired girl going to do next? Would she visit the beast garden or get a rainbow cone? Her new garments will be ready tomorrow. Shall I have them delivered? The tailor asked. Of course, the dark fairy said. Then she waved her hand. A puff of fairy dust appeared, and three gold coins soared through the air and landed on the tailor's counter. Good day. The tailor hurried to the door, opened it, then bowed as she flew past. Thank you for your patronage, madam, he said. The crowd parted as the dark fairy and her daughter flew back to their limousine. Some bowed, some curtsied, while others dropped to their knees.
Who was that fairy with the blue hair? Fabel asked, once they were driving back up Main Street. Her name is Mrs. Good Fairy, and she is of no importance, the dark fairy replied. This didn't make sense to Fabel. But she's a fairy. You told me that fairies are the most important beings. The dark fairy gently pushed a loose strand of hair from Fabel's forehead. Yes, it is true that fairies are extra special, because fairies are made of magic. The fairy with the blue hair is a fairy godmother. She has limited abilities. But we, my darling daughter, are dark fairies, and we wield unlimited power. Which is why we are the most admired and the most feared. Feared? Fabel realized the look she'd seen in the tailor's eyes, and in everyone's eyes when looking at her mother. It had been fear. Why are we feared? Because, my dear, while fairy godmothers are servants to their magic, we dark fairies serve no one. And that was the day when Fabel Thorne learned exactly who she was and who she was expected to to become. Chapter three, Pyramid Practice. Fabel dropped Spindle off at the school's creature daycare center. Even though he was a very happy, well-behaved puppy, she couldn't keep an eye on him and her team at the same time. Her goal was to mold the ever after high cheer hexers into champions. But it wouldn't be easy. They still needed lots of guidance. So she didn't want any cute, tail-wagging distractions. Bye, she said, after planting a kiss on the top of Spindle's head. Have fun. She set him onto the wood chip covered floor. He scampered away to join a hedgehog and a baby bear in a game of chase. Fabel watched for a moment to make sure he was okay then headed outside for practice. She timed her arrival so that she would swoop in exactly five minutes late. It was important to make a grand entrance, but it was also important that they waited for her and not the other way around. She flew toward the field, the tips of her sneakers skimming the grass. Then she landed next to a pile of pom-poms. Listen up, she said to a group of six fairies. The six fairies had joined the cheer hexing squad after Fabel became captain. And though these fairies were notoriously hot tempered and feisty, they were the reason why the team was growing in popularity and why they had a good chance of winning regionals. Flying in formation was an awe inspiring move, bringing the crowd to their feet every time. If Fabel had her way, the cheer hexing squad would consist exclusively of fairies so that all cheers could be conducted in midair. But unfortunately, there were three wingless members on the team, which meant they had to do land-based cheers as well. Too bad. The fairies flew into a frenzy as Fabel approached. Fabel, Fabel, she's the one. She's the one who makes cheer hexing fun. Get out of my way! I saw her first. Quit pushing! You quit pushing! Like lemmings, the six gathered around their leader, ready to follow her anywhere. They were Fabel's minions. Having grown up in fairy town, they were in awe of her. This awe was partially real, but it was also keen strategy. They knew that by being in Fabel's favor now, they stood a better chance of being in her favor when she became the next Dark Fairy. As the Dark Fairy's friends, they would become part of the fairy elite. Fabel, you look glam. Adore your nail polish. I adore her nail polish more. You're just saying that because she likes me better. Want me to spell it out for you? I'm her favorite. When tempers flared, and they often did among these six, a hailstorm of spells could erupt, resulting in tails growing from backsides, 
hair catching fire, and pustules sprouting on noses. The constant bickering annoyed Faybell, but having them fight for her attention was also satisfying. Let them grovel. That's what minions are supposed to do. Faybell raised a hand to silence them. They drew closer together, waiting for their captain to speak. Where's the rest of the team? There, a fairy said, pointing. Four students were hurriedly walking toward the field. A buff boy with brown hair, a tall girl with extremely long auburn hair, a petite girl with flaxen hair, and a winged girl with blue hair. Upon spotting the blue-haired girl, the six sneered in the exact same way. Farah, they whispered with disdain. For if there was one thing they could agree on, aside from showing loyalty to Faybell, it was that they disliked Farah Goodfairy, daughter of the fairy godmother from Cinderella's story. Faybell joined them in the sneer. Farah chose to walk alongside her friends, lowering herself to their ground level. Where was her fairy pride? And to make matters worse, Farah had befriended a new student at school, Michelle, daughter of the Little Mermaid. Not only did Michelle lack wings, but she also practically turned into a fish when she was in water. A fish! Hi, Farah called with a wave. You're all late, Fabel said, hands on hips. Sorry, Hunter told her. It's my fault. I ripped my shirt. Hunter was the son of the huntsman, and being one of the most muscular guys on campus, he tended to wear out his shirts quite often. But Farah fixed it. He pointed to his biceps. The shirt had been mended with shiny blue thread. I didn't use magic, Farah said with a smile. I used real thread, so it's a permanent fix. It won't change back at midnight. You're so talented. Nina Thumble, the flaxen-haired girl, told her. Fabel rolled her eyes. Fairy godmothers did one thing and one thing only. They make dreams come true, as Farah liked to say, which was totally lame. They couldn't conjure black magic or cast evil spells. They could only make things look better like turning a ratty dress into a ball gown, or transforming a pumpkin into a carriage. It was superficial magic, and nothing, in Fabel's opinion, to boast about. And it only lasted until the last stroke of midnight. What a joke. Okay, listen up, Fabel said, clapping her hands to get everyone's attention. It's time to get started. We only have four weeks until regionals, so I expect everyone to be here on time, ready to work. Today we're going to learn a new pyramid formation. We're going to do an inverted pyramid. Inverted? But I thought Headmaster Grimm didn't want us doing any kind of pyramid, Holly O'Hare pointed out. From one look, it was obvious that Holly was the daughter of Rapunzel. Her hair reached past her knees. Sometimes the other cheer hexers got entangled in it. Pyramids can be dangerous. You're scared, one of the six fairies said. You're afraid of heights. Can you blame me? Holly asked. My destiny is to be locked in a tower. Heights aren't exactly my favorite thing. You know, I also remember the headmaster saying we shouldn't do pyramids, Nina said. The daughter of Thumbelina, Nina was a good head shorter than everyone else. As the smallest member of the team, she was the most afraid of being crushed. Fabel glowered. She didn't like being questioned. It was true that the last inverted pyramid they'd attempted had been a royal fairy fail. She hadn't overestimated Hunter's strength. He'd simply gotten distracted when his girlfriend, Ashlyn Ella, walked by and he'd ended up at the bottom of a heap of cheer hexers. There'd been bruises, sprains, and scraped knees and elbows, and six angry fairies tossing spells at one another. 
The headmaster had also been walking past at the time, and he'd been concerned about having to explain injuries to their parents. Keep it safe, he told them. Fabel tapped her foot, the way an annoyed cat taps its tail. Headmaster Grimm was always getting in the way with his rules. I haven't received written notice that an inverted pyramid is forbidden. Have any of you? Holly shrugged. No, but then the decision is mine. As your captain, I say we try it again. If we're going to win regionals, we have to master the inverted pyramid. She raised an eyebrow, daring them to question her decision. No one said a thing. Fabel smiled with satisfaction. Excellent. Then let's get started. She flapped her wings and was about to lead her team onto the field when a voice called out, Hi, everyone. What now? Fabel grumbled. She turned to find Justine Dancer hurrying toward them, clipboard in hand. Justine was the daughter of the 12th dancing princess. Justine had long dancer's legs and wavy black hair. Fabel winced as Justine's crown caught a blinding ray of sunlight. The wingless world had so many queens and kings, princes and princesses. It seemed as if half the population at Ever After High were royalty, destined for thrones. But in the fairy world, there was only one who ruled. Only one who commanded the fealty of all fairies. Hey, can I talk to you? Justine asked. We're in the middle of practice, Fabel said snippily. She hovered a few feet in the air. I just wanted to give you one of these. Justine pulled a flyer from her clipboard. I wrote a play for a theater club. I'm going to direct and choreograph. Writer, director, and choreographer? Hunter asked. Wow, that's impressive. Congratulations, Farah said. Justine blushed. Thanks. Fabel landed in the grass, then stood face to face with Justine. Did you run all the way out here for some sort of purpose? Or did you just want to tell us how amazing you are? The six fairies snickered. Justine stepped back. Uh, she swallowed nervously. She knew, as did everyone in the fairy tale world, that it was never a good idea to annoy a fairy. I came out here because I'm holding auditions. You don't have to be a member of the theater club. We'd love some new talent. Fabel read the poster. Once upon a spell. An original fairy tale written, directed, and choreographed by Justine Dancer. Produced by Ever After High's Theater Club. Open auditions. Saturday at noon in the Charmatorium. Sign-up sheets posted on the Charmatorium door. Auditions? Fabel folded her arms. Are you joking? My cheer hexers are athletes, not actors. Besides, they're way too busy to be in a play. I'm not, one of the six fairies said. Fabel shot her a look. As I said, they're way too busy. What about you? Justine asked. Me? Fabel smoothed her skirt. My schedule is wicked packed. I have a full course load with general villainy, history of evil spells, magicology, and home evilnomics. I'm on the royal debate team, I'm president of the villain club, and I'm captain of this team. I'm up to my wingtips in activities. Yeah, up to her wingtips. You tell her, Fabel. Fabel, Fabel, she's the one. She's up to her wingtips, and that's no fun. Even if she had a gap in her schedule, Fabel thought acting was a ridiculous waste of time. Why bother? Actors didn't end up leading kingdoms. How could being in some stupid play possibly help her future evil career? But Farah, Hunter, Holly, and Nina had gathered around the flyer. I've never acted in a play, Farah said. But I'd love to work on costumes. I can turn rags into silk and plastic beads into pearls. I'm pretty handy that way. And if you want the costumes to last past midnight, 
I also know how to sew by hand. She pointed to Hunter's shirt. That sounds great, but actually, I was hoping you'd audition, Justine told her. You see, I need someone who can fly for real. Why for real? Hunter asked. Can't one of your actors just put on a pair of wings and look like a fairy? A collective snort arose from Fabel and her six fairies. Dream on, Fabel said. I don't care if your actor has won the Golden Goblin Award. Fake wings will not make a human look like a real fairy. After all, we're made of magic. She and her fairy smiled wickedly, releasing little poofs of fairy dust from their fingertips like miniature fireworks. Holly and Hunter sneezed. Nina wiped fairy dust from her eyes. Justine blocked the dust with her clipboard. Under normal circumstances, anyone could audition for the fairy role, Justine explained. But Headmaster Grimm said I can't use ropes to mimic flying. The fairy dust settled, and she lowered the clipboard. I guess they did a play called Escape of the Golden Goose a few years ago, and the lead got tangled up in the ropes, flew into the audience, and fell right on top of Professor Rumpelstiltskin. She cringed. So I either cut the flight scenes from my play, or I find someone who can fly for the part. I don't want to cut the scenes. As I said, we're too busy, Fabel told her. She was growing tired of all this talk about Justine's play. What a waste of time. You sure you won't audition? Justine asked Farah. You could do costumes too if you wanted. I'd love to find a fairy for the role. Well, Farah touched the tip of her nose as she considered the plea. It was a gesture she did quite often, one that some found adorable, but Fabel found annoying as hex. Perhaps I could do both. Justine squealed with delight. She started to hug Farah, but stopped midway. Oh, before you agree, I should probably tell you, the roles for a fairy queen, a wicked fairy queen, would you be okay with that? Fabel's skin prickled. What did you just say? She rose a few feet in the air. Did you say a wicked fairy queen? Yes, she's not the leading role, but she's super important to the plot. Hunter nudged Farah with his elbow. Go for it, he encouraged. It's good to do something unexpected. I mean, look at me. I was trained to track animals in the woods and to rescue damsels. When I told my friends I was going to try out for cheer hexing, they teased me. But as it turns out, I really like being on this team. Except that time when the pyramid collapsed. Yeah, go for it, Holly said, putting an arm around Farah's shoulders. You'll be great, Nina added. Great? Anger made its way from Fabel's toes to her wingtips. She wouldn't have been surprised if steam had shot out of her ears. A future fairy godmother was incapable of acting villainous. Farah was a meek little good fairy. Giving her the part of the wicked fairy queen would be like telling a kitten to become a lion. Okay, you convinced me, Farah said with a giggle. Fabel watched with disbelief as the little good fairy signed her name to Justine's audition sheet. I'll give it a try. Fabel Thorne knew what she had to do. She didn't have to give it a try. The wicked fairy queen was the role she'd been born to play. Move out of the way, she ordered, pushing between Farah and Justine. Then she grabbed the pen and signed her name to the audition sheet. She made sure she wrote in bigger letters, and with swirlier swirls, and an exclamation mark. Farah Good Fairy, Fabel Thorn. I thought you were too busy, Justine said with surprise. I'm, I'm never too busy to help a fellow student, Fabel said with a deceptive smile. 
If you need a real fairy, then a real fairy you shall have. Then she turned to Farah. May the best fairy win. The words were so sticky sweet she could barely get them out of her mouth. Justine tucked her clipboard under her arm. Thanks so much. Remember, auditions are this Saturday at noon in the Charmatorium. Good luck, or as we say in the theater, break a leg. And off she went. Yes, break a leg, Fabel said to Farah. The six fairies snickered. Or a wing. Yeah, break a wing. <laughs> Fabel knew that landing this role was the chance of a lifetime. Playing the wicked fairy queen in front of the entire Ever After High community would send a very clear message. Faye Bell Thorne was the real deal, no doubt about it. The only deal. Come on, team, she said. Let's go kick some crown. The six fairies chanted as they followed. Stomp, 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 stomp your feet. Ever after high clap can't be beat. Chapter four. The cheer factor. Magicology class was taught by one of the most mysterious professors on campus, an elderly woman named Madame Baba Yaga. She was the department head for all classes having to do with spells, hexes, and general witchery. Whether you called her a witch or a sorceress, she looked like a combination of both. Her long gray hair was snarled and matted and decorated with tiny bird bones. Her fingernails were chipped and as gray as ashes. But she didn't wear a pointed hat or a black cape. Rather, she preferred a gypsy look with bangle earrings and fringed scarves. And she traveled by pillow, which she insisted was more comfortable than a broomstick and easier on her old joints. Madame Baba Yaga held student conferences and staff meetings in her office, which was one of the most unique rooms on campus because it never stayed in one place. Whether this was the result of Madame Baba Yaga wishing to challenge her visitors, or the office itself growing bored and wanting new scenery, was not quite clear. But throughout the day, the office would raise itself onto giant yellow chicken legs and rush around until it found a new location. Thus, meeting with the professor was always a chore, which totally annoyed Fabel. Fortunately, the magicology curriculum included lots of experimentation, and that required a larger room, so it was taught in a laboratory that never changed location. A footbridge over a moat, three flights of stairs, and two hallways were all that was required of the students to get to class. It was a grand room with tall windows, stone archways, and walls lined with bookshelves. Lab tables were set up on one side, with rows of chairs on the other side for lectures. Magicology was reserved for students who could wield magic, the sons and daughters of witches, warlocks, sorcerers, and, of course, fairies. Fabel and her six fairy cheerhexers were the first to arrive. They claimed the front row, as they always did. Being in the front row meant the rest of the class could see Fabel even if it was just the back of her head. But nonetheless, her presence was known, unlike those who chose to sit quietly in the back row, wanting to go unnoticed. Like Raven Queen, daughter of the Evil Queen. Without turning around, Fabel was aware of Raven's presence. Fairy senses are finely tuned instruments. Raven used the same shampoo every day, moonlight essence, the moment Fabel detected the scent, she knew her nemesis was near. There was no reason for Fabel to feel threatened by Raven's presence in magicology. Though destined for villainy, Raven refused to embrace dark magic. But in the past, when she'd tried her hand at good magic, the spells had almost always backfired. Her magic skills had improved slightly in recent months, but they still couldn't rival Fabel's. 
it served her right, Fabel believed, for denying her evil side. Raven was a rebel who didn't want her destiny. Fabel shivered with disdain. She could barely stand to be in the same room with that traitor. Hi, Raven. Farah Goodfairy's voice drifted from the back row. Why was she sitting next to Raven? They made such an odd pairing. But that was what happened at Ever After High. Friendships formed because some students chose to go off book. Fabel shivered again. Good morning, students. Madame Baba Yaga floated into the room. She sat cross-legged on her magic pillow. A yellow scarf was draped over her head, and her peasant blouse had embroidered sleeves. The pillow carried her to the front of the classroom, then lowered her to eye level. Class is now in session. Please put away all mirror phones, mirror pads, and any other non-magical apparatuses, and focus your attention on the contents of this box in my hands. As she opened the box, dozens of teacups drifted out, then landed on her desk. Some were cracked, some chipped, some missing handles. The cleaning fairies have asked us to help with a project, so we shall put our magic skills to good use this afternoon by fixing these teacups. The cleaning fairies were among the smallest of fairies, about the size of a person's thumb. They flitted around the campus with their tiny feather dusters, brooms, and mops, leaving trails of fairy dust in their wake. No one had to ask Madame Baba Yaga why there were so many broken teacups. Stupid Wonderlandians, Fabel mumbled under her breath. Just like her roommate, Bunny, the Wonderland students were insane about tea. In fact, one of their favorite sayings was, Tea-rific. Because they drank it all the time, the Castleteria now stocked teacups, as did all the coffee carts around campus. Those darn things were practically everywhere. I'm afraid I couldn't quite hear your comment, Madame Baba Yaga said, looking directly at Fabel. Fabel cleared her throat. I was wondering, Madame Baba Yaga, why you want us to fix teacups? Isn't this a waste of our time? I mean, why not just get new ones? The other six cheer hexers nodded. Yeah, that's right. Uh-huh, you go, girl. Madame Baba Yaga pressed her fingertips together in a thoughtful manner. I understand your concern for time management, Miss Thorne. But while this may seem to be trivial work, no magic is trivial. Working with small pieces of porcelain will teach you control and patience. And it's recycling, Ginger Breadhouse pointed out. As Nina always says, it's good to recycle. Fabel frowned at the sound of Ginger's voice. She was another rebel who didn't want to accept her villainous destiny. I love fixing things, Farah said, her voice bubbling with enthusiasm. This will be fun. Fabel raised her hand. I'm wondering, Professor, is the teacup considered fixed if the spell wears off at midnight? Shouldn't that be considered a fairy fail? It is not your place to concern yourself with another student's grades, Madame Baba Yaga said. Fabel humphed and slumped in her chair. For this assignment, you will use wands. Madame Baba Yaga floated over to the supply closet and pulled out a handful of wands. Then she tossed them into the air. Each wand flew directly to a student. Fabel didn't need a wand. Fairies could use their fingertips as conduits for magic. But because she wanted a top grade in magicology, she grabbed the wand. Madame Baba Yaga then distributed the broken cups so that each student had a small pile on his or her desk. I can't believe I'm fixing teacup chips, Fabel grumbled. She tapped a cracked green cup with her wand and said, Crack, be gone, fix that cup. 
the porcelain regrew inside the crack, and the cup looked good as new. So easy. Laughter erupted in the very back of the room. A few students had gathered around Farah's desk. Three of her teacups had been fixed and were dancing around her desk. Ginger, however, wasn't having much luck. One by one, her teacups jumped onto the floor, then scuttled from the room. Come back here, she called. She pointed her wand. One of the cups morphed into a cupcake. I'm much better at cooking spells, Ginger said in frustration. Faybell looked at the remaining pile on her desk. She had four more cups, and two were covered in dozens of cracks and chips. It would take forever to fix all the little imperfections. However, there was a time-saving method she could use. Faybell smiled wickedly, for she had a special talent. She could take any spell and make it more powerful with a cheer hex. She called this the cheer factor. So she stepped away from the table, pulled her pom-poms from her bag, and cheered. Fix them up, rustle, rustle, fix them up, rustle, rustle, cracks be gone, stomp, stomp, fix these cups, stomp, stomp. With a proud smirk, Fabel set her pom-poms aside and watched her spell take root. Fairy dust swirled around the cups as the porcelain began to regrow. But then the cheer hex took an unexpected turn. Even after the cracks had been filled, the porcelain kept growing and growing. Each cup swelled, then exploded. Eek! Ginger cried as a storm of porcelain shards flew at her. She covered her face as they landed on her pink dress. Their sharp edges tore the fabric like tiny claws. Fabel narrowed her eyes. That wasn't the result she'd expected. But then again, a shower of sharp teacup shards could be considered evil. She might get extra credit. Are you okay? Raven asked. Yes, but Ginger held up her hand. I pricked my finger. She looked nervously at Fabel. Everyone looked at Fabel. Raven stepped forward. Fabel, did you do that on purpose? You know it's not Ginger's destiny to prick her finger. Are you really going to lecture me about destiny? Fabel's snort was echoed by her minions. I know all about destiny. I embrace it. You threw yours away. Raven winced as if Fabel's words had stung. Was there some lingering guilt? Some questions about her choices? A single drop of blood ran down Ginger's finger. Am I going to fall into a hundred years sleep? She asked worriedly. I can't go to sleep. I have a test tomorrow in Cooking Classic, and I have a new episode of my mirror cast show to record. Don't get your pink head in a tizzy, Fabel said with a dismissive wave. I didn't curse you. Ginger let out a big sigh of relief. Madame Baba Yaga located a bandage in one of the many first aid kits. Accidents were plentiful in magicology. Farah hurried to Ginger's side. I can't heal your finger, but I can fix your dress if you'd like. Ginger's face lit up. Yes, would you please? Farah looked to Madame Baba Yaga for permission. She nodded. Farah waved her wand in the air. A little musical sound emerged, and a trail of fairy dust swooped around Ginger. In the blink of an eye, Ginger's dress was lovely again. As good as new, Farah said. Until midnight, that is. Thanks, Ginger said. You're so helpful. I make dreams come true, Farah told her. It's what I do. It's what I do. Fabel mimicked under her breath. While the other students finished their assignment, Madame Baba Yaga handed Fabel a dust broom and instructed her to sweep up the mess. The six cheer hexers began to fight over the broom. I'll do it, 
No, let me. I want to help Fabel. No, I do. Stop kicking me. Only if you stop kicking me. Can't we just call the cleaning fairies? Fabel asked. There is a wise old saying, Madame Baba Yaga said. She who cleans up her own mess learns to not make it the next time. With a flick of her wrist, the dust broom landed in Fabel's hand. Then she floated around the room, checking on everyone else's progress. As Fabel swept up the shards, she tried to hide her frustration. Her attempt to impress everyone had failed. But at least Raven hadn't impressed them either. Just as the dismissal bell rang, Fabel dumped the shards into the garbage. She grabbed her equipment bag and was about to leave when Madame Baba Yaga called her name. Ms. Thorne, a word with you. Chapter five, a bit of advice. As the classroom cleared, Fabel's shoulders stiffened. She'd never been asked to stay after class. Yes, Professor? Fabel didn't smile sweetly or bat her lashes. She didn't need to fake politeness. A villain was a villain, and Madame Baba Yaga would never try to change that. There were some who considered her to be a villain, since she was a daughter of the darker forces. But Fabel had never witnessed villainous behavior from the elderly professor. Strict behavior, certainly, but never evil. Madame Baba Yaga slid off her magic cushion and stood in front of Fabel. Though diminutive in stature and a bit crooked in the spine, she revealed her vitality in her eyes and voice. It is apparent to me that you are not fond of Ms. Queen. Well, that's putting it mildly, Fabel said. I detest her. Raven is a rebel, and she ruined her story. What makes you believe that Ms. Queen has only one story? What do you mean? Our stories contain many chapters, Ms. Thorne. Cursing Sleeping Beauty was just one chapter in your mother's life. You, for example, are another chapter. Do you see my point? No. Madame Baba Yaga sighed. Her scarf slipped from her head, but she did not adjust it. Instead, she looked deep into Fabel's eyes. Ms. Queen is not your rival. She should be, Fabel said. She should be doing everything she can to be a villain, but she turned her back on her story. I won't do that. I will curse Briar Beauty, and it will be a glorious moment in fairy tale history. I'm proud of my story. But you want more than your story, don't you? You want to expand your destiny. That's the real reason why you see Ms. Queen as your rival. Fabel said nothing. What the heck? Was the professor a mind reader? Ms. Queen's refusal to become the next evil queen leaves a broken link in a powerful chain, Madame Baba Yaga said. I am not judging you, Miss Thorne. It is natural for a villain to want absolute power. You are following your instincts, and that is what we expect. If Raven doesn't want to be the next evil queen, then someone has to take her place, Fabel said. Why not me? Madame Baba Yaga nodded. Your passion is admirable. There are many at this school who are giving up on their wicked heritage. She walked to her desk and sat in the carved chair. And Ms. Goodfairy, what is your problem with her? Fabel adjusted her ponytail. Oh, she's just annoying. All that goody-goody stuff all day long. I'll fix this, I'll fix that. Everyone thinks her magic is so wonderful, but all she does is make things look better. That's not significant magic. It's not even powerful. How can an entire career be built on magic that only lasts until midnight? I don't get it. But 
Everyone loves her. And you want that love? No, of course not, Fabel rolled her eyes. I'm a villain. I don't need love. To Fabel's relief, the professor didn't push the conversation. Fabel looked at her mirror phone. She needed to get some throne work done before dinner. How much longer was she expected to hang out? Madame Baba Yaga opened a ledger and grabbed a quill. Fabel leaned closer, watching while the professor wrote two capital F's next to Fabel's name. What in ever after? Why'd I get a fairy fail? You did not complete today's class assignment. But madam, I only broke teacups. And when you think about it, they were already broken. The professor wrote an A next to Farah's name. The assignment was to fix the cups. Fabel stomped her foot. But this is so unfair. My shards tore Ginger's dress. That's a very wicked thing to do. I should get some kind of credit for being wicked. But you were not wicked on purpose, were you? Fabel considered saying she'd ruined Ginger's dress on purpose, but there was no use in lying. Madame Baba Yaga had the unnerving ability to detect deception. While your work today was disappointing, you show a good deal of potential, Ms. Thorne. You have discovered that you possess a special kind of magic. Many of my students go years before they figure out their own magical touches. You can use a cheer to increase the potency of your magic. I find that most intriguing. Then can I have extra credit to offset the fairy fail? Fabel watched, hoping the professor would make a new mark in the ledger. No, I think not. You used your magic touch unwisely. Today, you only broke teacups. But tomorrow, who knows what could happen if you are not more careful. You must hone your skills. You must proceed slowly. I don't want to go slowly. It's so boring. And besides, I don't have the time. I have a zillion things to get done. Madame Baba Yaga set aside her quill, folded her hands once again, and looked into Fabel's eyes. Fabel Thorne, your impatience could be your downfall. Listen to me very carefully. Those who are destined to wield great power, be it evil or good, must be the most careful of all. Fabel smiled. You think I'm destined to wield great power? If you so choose. I do choose. I do. Then have fortitude, Miss Thorne. Don't rush the process. Your magic will grow as you grow. It will mature as you mature. You scared Miss Breadhouse today, and some other students too. They should be scared of me. Fabel said proudly. She puffed out her chest. They should all be scared of me. I'm a villain. Yes, but this was not a good show of your skill. It did not make them respect you. Dark magic only brings respect if it's done well. An unnecessary evil spell is a waste of magic and talent. She picked up her quill again. That is all. Good day, Miss Thorne. Bag in hand, Fabel flew from the classroom. Despite today's fairy fail, Madame Baba Yaga had told Fabel that she was destined for greatness. At that moment, Fabel felt as if she could fly all the way to the moon. Chapter 6 a perky prediction. After leaving Magicology, Fabel headed toward the Creature Daycare Center to pick up Spindle. Out on the quad, a group of students stood beneath a giant mirror screen, their heads tilted upward, their eyes wide with anticipation. 
Mirror screens hung all over campus, on walls, on tree trunks, but they were not provided so students could check their hair or makeup, though daring charming always used them for this purpose. The mirror screens were for school-wide communication. Headmaster Grimm used them to deliver his constant announcements, and Blondie Locks used the screens to broadcast her mirror cast show, Just Right, a daily dose of journalism, gossip, and commentary about the deeds, doings, goings-on, and goings-wrong at Ever After High. Blondie's show was what the students were eagerly awaiting. Blondie's smiling face appeared in the center of the mirror screen. Her blonde curls bounced as she talked. Her baby blue eyes were practically electric. She possessed the kind of energy that always sent a chill of revulsion down Fabel's spine. Perkiness, that's what it was. Pure, undiluted perkiness. Blondie practically bubbled over with the stuff. But though Blondie was an annoying chatterbug, Fabel stopped to listen. Blondie was always in the know, and that was an enviable talent. Hello, fellow fairy tales, Blondie said. It's time for a brand new edition of Just Right. Theme music began to play. As usual, I have the latest scoop on what's happening at Ever After High. The theme music faded. On this very day, both Fabel Thorne and Farrah Goodfairy signed up to audition for the role of the Wicked Fairy Queen in the theater club's upcoming play. According to my sources, neither Farrah nor Fabel has any acting experience, so this should be interesting. Here to discuss the situation is Justine Dancer, the play's director, writer, and choreographer. It wasn't unusual for Fabel to be mentioned on Blondie's show. There'd been a report about her selection as cheer-hexing captain, another report about her campaign and election as villain club president, and a string of reports about the time she'd competed for the title and should have won next top villain. Even though she still needed to get spindle and she had a ton of throne work, she decided to stick around and watch the show for a few minutes. Blondie always had an opinion. And if Justine was favoring someone for the role, Blondie would get her to admit it. The camera shot widened to make room for Justine. She and Blondie sat side by side. They both had so many waves and curls, their hair filled the entire screen. Blondie didn't waste a second. Tell us, Justine, who do you think will make a better wicked fairy queen, Fabel or Farah? I don't know, Justine said with a shrug. My decision will be based on their auditions. But doesn't it seem to you that Fabel was made for the part? She's perfectly wicked. She has evil in her blood. I've seen her lose her temper, and she can be downright dangerous. A couple of students who'd been standing next to Fabel sidestepped, creating a wide berth between themselves and the evil-blooded fairy. Blondie held the microphone closer to Justine. The very nature of acting is to pretend to be someone different from oneself, Justine explained. Often, it's more difficult to play a part that's similar to who you really are. That's ridiculous, Fabel thought. Because her blood coursed with evil DNA, playing the wicked fairy queen would be super easy. But Farah was way too sweet. So sweet, she was probably made of candy, not magic. Well, I still think it would be fun to take a poll of the students. Blondie looked into the camera. What do you think, fellow fairy tales? Will Fabel or Farah prove to be the better actor and get the part? Hexed me right now. All the students in the quad pulled out their mirror phones and began hexting. Fabel didn't bother. She felt a bit uneasy. If this was a popularity contest, Farah might stand a chance at winning, but only because she was a goody two wings. If the students really thought about it, really weighed the options of a silly future fairy godmother versus a malevolent future dark fairy, then 
there'd be no contest. Justine held up her clipboard. There's still room on the audition sheet, so if anyone watching would like to try out, please add your name. The sheet will be posted outside the charmatorium. Auditions are this Saturday. Along with the Wicked Fairy Queen, we'll need actors to play the Forgetful Prince, the Melancholy Princess, the Elderly King, and a family of trolls. We'll also need singers for chorus members and dancers for the dance troupe. Oh, the hecks are coming in, Blondie reported as she read from her own mirror phone. From early results, I can tell you that Farah Good Fairy is definitely favored to win the role. That doesn't matter to me, Justine said, shrugging. My decision will be based on the actual audition. Well, you heard it here. Farah is favored to win. Blondie leaned so close to the camera you could count her freckles. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time with the latest scoop. Remember, if it's not too hot or too cold, it's just right. The mirror screen went dark. Everyone turned and stared at Fabel. Her wings stiffened. She felt her cheeks go red. What are you do-gooders looking at? She snarled. You know I'm made for that part. Then she flew off in a huff. Blondie's prediction would not come to pass. She couldn't read the future. She wasn't even magical. At the creature daycare center, Fabel collected spindle. The little puppy was tuckered out. Though the hedgehog had rolled himself into a ball, the baby bear had proved to be as rambunctious as Spindle, and they'd chased each other for hours. Fabel gently set him into the puppy carrier and was about to leave when Farah entered the center. Hi, Fabel, she said, but she didn't smile in her usual way. She looked a bit sheepish. Uh, did you watch Blondie's show? Fabel said nothing. Don't pay any attention to that nonsense, Farah said. It doesn't matter what the student body thinks. It's up to Justine, and I'm sure you're a much better actor than I am. She reached into the sawdust-filled pen. A little mouse climbed onto her hand. Clydesdale loves coming here. There are so many critters to play with. She stroked the mouse's ears. Your puppy is very cute. Fabel continued to give her a cold shoulder. Why was Farah being so friendly? Didn't this girl know anything about competition? Have you chosen your monologue? Farah asked. This question surprised Fabel so much, she broke her silence. My what? Your monologue, you know, for the audition. You have to memorize it. I'm supposed to memorize something? If there was one thing Fabel hated, it was the feeling of being left out. Left out of parties, of course, but equally distressing was being left out of information. I thought we just showed up and read from the script. Oh no, you're supposed to have a two-minute monologue prepared. You have to memorize it and perform it. Fabel clenched her hand around the puppy carrier's handle. She squeezed so hard, her hand began to ache. This was preposterous. She had a zillion things to do that week. She had to perfect the pyramid and write a new cheer. Plus, there was a research paper for history of evil spells, a speech for the villain club, and all her daily throne work. Besides, why should she have to work for this role? It should be handed to her on a silver platter. I don't know how Justine expects me to find time, Fabel said. Does she think I'll just conjure a time-expanding spell? She knows that's against the rules. I can help you. Farah's blue eyes sparkled. I'd be very happy to help. The little mouse squeaked as if he wanted to help too. They were both so happy and cute that it turned Fabel's stomach. Why would you do that? Fabel asked, raising an eyebrow suspiciously. We're competing against each other. She would never help a competing cheer hexer. Never, ever, after. 
This good fairy clearly had cotton candy between her ears. That notion gave Fabel an idea. Her speech for Villain Club could be called How Being Full of Goodness Impairs One's Intelligence. I don't think of us as competitors, Farah replied with a sincere smile. Besides, it's all friendly, right? Fabel almost laughed out loud. The words friendly and competitors had no right to be in the same sentence. Competition existed for one thing only, victory. Winners ruled, losers drooled. No one ever said the opposite. I don't need your help, Fabel said. I'm perfectly capable of doing this on my own. I never need help. Snoring arose. Spindle had fallen asleep, exhausted from his playdates. Fabel tucked the puppy carrier under her arm and zipped out of the room. Imagine that, a good fairy wanting to help a dark fairy. Didn't anyone in this school know her place? But as Fabel rounded the corner, a thought filled her mind, an idea as brilliant and sparkly as fairy dust. Practicing her audition with Farah would be the perfect way for Fabel to check out her competition. And that would be so much easier than sending the cheer hexers to spy. They always got distracted or ended up bickering. If Fabel wanted to get something done correctly, she knew it was best to do it herself. She turned around and flew back into the creature daycare center. Farah was setting her mouse into a tiny carrier. On second thought, Fabel said, I do have a bit of time right now, if you insist. Oh, that's great news. How about we go into my room? I have a book on monologues that I checked out from the library. She picked up her tiny carrier and whispered through the little window. What do you think about that, Clydesdale? We're going to have guests. The mouse squeaked again. Faye Bell Thorne, daughter of the Dark Fairy, was on her way to the room of a good fairy. Life at Ever After High was certainly full of surprises. Chapter 7 Light and Dark There'd been a time in her younger years when Faye Bell hadn't cared whether her friends were descended from evil bloodlines. She'd just wanted to have fun. If you lived in Fairytown and you received a notice to send your offspring to a playdate at the Dark Fairy's villa, you did not refuse. All sorts of children filled Fabel's summers with laughter and games, but one in particular was her favorite. It was the summer before kindergarten, and Ginger Breadhouse, daughter of the Candy Witch, visited once a week. The first time they met, Fabel was speechless. She stared open-mouthed at the strange woman who was holding the little girl's hand. Lucille, the chambermaid, flew around Fabel's head, then whispered in her ear, She's a witch! Ginger's mother was not just a witch. She was a wicked witch, and she looked the part with her matted green hair, pointed black hat, ragged black dress, and battered military boots. The dark fairy greeted her guests. Fabel, darling, I'd like you to meet the candy witch and her adorable daughter, Ginger. Hello, dearie, the witch said. She leaned close to Fabel. Would you prefer to be baked or fricasseed? Fabel gulped. I'm kidding, of course. The witch cackled. It's a joke, <laughs> a joke. My mom doesn't eat kids, Ginger said with a smile. She had bright pink hair that was pulled into two pigtails. She never ate Hansel or Gretel. That's just a mean thing people say about her. Ginger held out a plate of cookies. These are for you. Fabel peered at the doughy lumps. Are those cookies humming? She asked. Yep, Ginger giggled. They're made with singing sprinkles. Wow! 
Fabel reached for one, but the dark fairy gently blocked her hand. I don't mean to insult you, but by any chance, are those cookies poisoned? The dark fairy asked the witch. Poisoned? She burst into a fit of cackling. Of course not. I would never try to poison a comrade's daughter. Fabel turned and looked at Lucille, who was hovering beside her ear. Comrade? Fabel whispered. They are comrades because they are both villains, Lucille whispered in return. Go on, girls. Go play while the candy witch and I visit, the dark fairy said. But don't bother the goblin guards, and don't go near the dragon. He hasn't been fed yet. With squeals of delight, each girl grabbed a cookie and ran outside. Fabel ate her cookie in two bites. Ginger put an ear to Fabel's tummy. It's still humming, she said. They both fell over laughing. Those summer days were lovely and carefree. Rolling in the grass, leapfrogging through the gardens, splashing in the koi pond. Ginger always brought new and unpoisoned treats, like massive macaroons, spelly donuts, and cinnamon trolls. It was childhood at its best. One evening, after a day of playing with Ginger, Fabel sat at the long dining table with her mother. Fabel's cheeks were rosy from the sun, and her little wings were tired. Mother, she asked as she stuck her spoon into a bowl of fairy berry sherbet. Why don't you look like a villain? What do you mean? The dark fairy asked. I mean, Ginger's mom looks like a witch, and the sorcerer at the end of the street looks like a sorcerer, but you don't wear black capes or black hats. You don't wear black at all. How delightfully observant of you. The dark fairy sat back in her chair and smiled approvingly at her daughter. Black is used in stories to represent dark forces, this is true, while light is used in stories to represent goodness. But light isn't good or bad. Light has no moral compass. Light is power. Light is energy. And magic is the manipulation of energy. Her diamond necklace twinkled beneath the chandelier. Her pearl white dress radiated. Her pale skin glowed as if she were a living light bulb. Fabel didn't completely understand, but she knew that her mother's message was important. The dark fairy took another sip, then continued. Why should we, the darkest of fairies, shroud ourselves in black capes and black hats? Why should we cling to the night? She pointed a finger at Fabel's bowl. A puff of fairy dust shot out, and a perfect swirl of whipped cream appeared on Fabel's sherbet. Embrace the light, the dark fairy said. Never, ever live in the shadows. Chapter 8 An Abundance of Blue Apparently, Farah Goodfairy had so many wingless friends, she'd gotten used to walking. There were times when it was necessary for all fairies to walk, when the doorway was too narrow, the ceiling too low, or the hall too crowded. But Fabel didn't care if her wings knocked a few students off their feet. She always made a point of flying whenever she could. Everyone else should make room for her. Hi, Farah. Hi, Cedar. How's it going, Farah? Hi, Melody. It's going great. Farah waved to passers-by as if she were in a pageant. She greeted this student and that student. They wished her happiness and health. Pleasantries were exchanged. She smiled, they smiled. She laughed, they laughed. It was some kind of mutual appreciation festival. Even her mouse squeaked his greetings. Fabel, however, elicited the opposite reaction. Most of the students glanced warily at her, or darted aside to avoid her wings. Well, 
I'm clearly not going to win a popularity contest, she realized. Normally, Faybell wouldn't give a twinkle about the good fairy's social status, but the undeniable truth that Pharaoh was beloved could hurt Faybell's chances of being cast as the wicked fairy queen. Even though Justine had said she'd hold a fair audition, she'd definitely want the performances to be sold out. Farah, with all her friends, would most likely draw a huge crowd. That fact alone could sway Justine's decision. Fabel's eyes narrowed as she thought about all this. Another reason to spy on Farah and crush her chances. Farah Goodfairy's room was tidy and quaint. No carrot tops littered the floor, or turnips, or any other stupid root vegetable. She'd made no decorating choices that would be considered trendy or bold, which surprised Fabel. She would have thought a fairy who focused on appearances so much would have a much louder room. But the simple decor sort of fit with Farah's personality, sweet and friendly. There was a canopied bed, lots of soft pillows, and an overstuffed chair that looked very inviting. And the paint, bedspread, pillows, and wallpaper palette were all variations of one color. What's the deal with you and the color blue? Fabel asked. It's my favorite color, Farah said. Then she pointed to her hair. Can you blame me? Blue is with me all the time. I'm so lucky. Plus, my roommate, Michelle, also loves blue. She says it reminds her of the ocean. Of course the mermaid would like blue, Fabel thought. She didn't admit that all the blue hues actually made her feel relaxed. If she had this room, she'd nap all the time, which would be fine if she were Briar Beauty, but not fine for a fairy who was trying to become the wickedest, vilest, darkest dark fairy ever after. Fabel stifled a yawn and her gaze traveled across a vast corkboard. Unlike her own room, there was no family crest with the motto, Doers of Dark Magic. Instead, Thera had covered the corkboard with photos of friends. There she was, smiling with apple white, taking a selfie with Ashlyn Ella, and posing with Blondie. And there she was with Justine, at a party that Fabel hadn't been invited to, since she was the daughter of the Dark Fairy, who never got invited to anything. And another photo of her and Justine at the Hocus Latte Cafe. You and Justine are friends? Fabel hissed. Sure, I'm friends with most everyone, Farah said simply. Fabel spun around and glared at her competitor. Oh, isn't that a delightful coincidence, she said, her voice dripping with insinuation. You're auditioning for a play, and you just happen to be friends with the director. That won't matter, Farah said, her cheeks reddening. Justine will choose based on talent. Uh-huh, you expect me to believe that? Fabel pointed to another photo, and another. You two apparently go to a lot of parties together. Did you see me at any of those parties? The ensuing silence was as thick as the Castleteria porridge. Farah opened her mouth, then closed it. She clearly didn't know what to say. How could she admit that she'd gone to all those parties without hurting Fabel's feelings? She was momentarily paralyzed by her niceness. How pitiful. Just so you know, I don't get invited to parties because it's my curse. It's not because people dislike me. I'm sure it's not, Farah said politely. The curse makes them forget to invite me. That's how it works. It's the same curse my mom has. That's why she wasn't invited to the celebration of Sleeping Beauty's birth. Got it? Okay. Farah nodded as if she understood. I'm sorry you have that curse. They stared at each other. The realization that Farah felt sorry for her only made Fabel more upset. Spindle woke from his nap and started yapping. Fabel placed the pet carrier onto the carpet, 
then set Spindle free. The puppy leaped out and immediately pounced on a sock, chewing it to bits. Don't worry about the sock, Farrah said. I can always fix it later. Who said I was worried? Faybelt darted over to Farrah's desk. It was piled high with books, utterly boring titles like 101 Things You Can Do With a Pumpkin, How to Turn a Mouse Into a House, and Other Affordable Decorating Tips. From Rags to Riches, How to Make Her Look Like a Princess. Faybelt picked up a book with a well-worn cover and read its title, Does Everything Have to End at Midnight? Why are you reading this? As Farah set her mouse into his little mouse castle, she explained, All fairy godmothers would like their spells to last longer, but we have to accept the midnight decree. Whenever I start to question this rule, I read this book, and it reminds me that midnight is part of my story, and I should be grateful that I'm given the opportunity to help others, even if it's only temporary. Why don't you try to change the rule? Change it? Sure. Fabel lowered her voice and whispered in an ominous way, with dark magic. Oh no, I'd never do that. Farah's gaze darted around. She looked like she wanted to run from the room, to run from the words themselves. Dark magic. A good fairy shouldn't even think about dark magic. You know that. A knock on the door broke the tension. Farah? Apple White entered the room. Oh, hello, Faybelle. How very, very odd to see you here. She walked up to Farah and stuck out her right leg. I'm going to dinner tonight with Daring, Darling, and Dexter, and my tights have a run. I called my dwarf network, but they can't get me a new pair until tomorrow. I'd be royally grateful if you'd... Of course. Farah flicked her wand. A few musical notes and some fairy dust drifted through the air, and voila, the tights were good as new. Thank you, Apple squealed with delight. I wish my story had a fairy godmother. You're the best. I owe you one. She hugged Farah. Fabel rolled her eyes. Why so much happiness? It was just a pair of tights. It's not as if Farah had made lasting impact on the world. Fabel told herself that the only reason Apple was fond of Farah was because of the good fairy's ability to mend tights and do other menial things like that. But deep down, Fabel knew better. Apple, like most of the students at Ever After High, truly liked Farah because Farah was nice. She cared. She helped. And if Fabel hadn't been so overscheduled and on a villain trajectory, she might have taken some time to hang out with Farah. Oh my godmother, am I starting to like her too? Fabel pushed that crazy thought from her head. Don't you get tired of helping everyone? She asked after Apple had left the room. Well, sometimes it's a bit tiring, I admit that. Farah sat on her bed and slipped off her blue shoes. But it's my duty and my destiny to help others. You know, I think that's why I'd like to be in this play. I'm always behind the scenes. I'm always the supporting role. It would be fun to be the star of the show, just one time. To be important. Behind the scenes? Fabel tried to remember the details of Farah's story. You turn mice into horses, a rat into a coachman, and a pumpkin into a coach. That's very important. She couldn't hide her sarcasm, and she didn't try. Farah frowned. I know you don't think my magic is significant, not compared with the kind of power you'll have. But sometimes, being able to change the way something looks does more than simply change the surface. It's not just about making Apple look good. If she feels good and she has confidence, then she feels empowered. That kind of attitude can change someone's destiny. Fabel leaned against the desk and folded her arms. Changing someone's destiny is the talk of a rebel. I'm not, 
Farah straightened her back and held her head high. It's my duty to serve others. That's what I do, and I'm proud to serve. And it's my duty to serve no one. But enough with the boring chit-chat. So, what about your monologue? Oh, right, the monologue. Farah smiled. She hurried to her desk and grabbed a book. I almost forgot. Have you read Shannon Pale's version of the Sleeping Beauty story? Fabel shook her head. Well, it's very good, especially the scene where the dark fairy bursts into the castle and confronts the king and queen. I chose that speech. Fabel clenched her jaw. Farah Good Fairy was about to perform the part of the story that belonged to Fabel's mother. Sure, it was a fictional version written by a best selling author, but it annoyed her to the core. Go ahead, Fabel said as she slowly sat on the edge of the desk. Amaze me. It would, of course, be a disastrous performance. Farah had no instinct for villainy. Farah cleared her throat. With the book in one hand, she unfurled her wings and lifted herself above the bed. Your majesties, she said, not in a sweet voice, but in one that demanded attention. Forgive my intrusion, but I couldn't help noticing that you are in the middle of a party. Did you forget to mail my invitation? Perhaps it was lost. Her brow furrowed, and her voice rose to a nearly thunderous level. Surely you wouldn't purposefully leave me off the guest list. You wouldn't dare. Spindle stopped chewing on the sock and dove under a pillow. Fabel could barely hide her surprise. The little good fairy was delivering the monologue like a pro. How had she conjured that powerful voice, the authoritative stance, the determination? One might think she'd been studying for years at a professional acting academy. If she was this good at the audition, there'd be a standing ovation for sure. Any notion of liking or spending time with this good fairy disintegrated. This was a competition, and there could only be one winner. Somehow, some way, Fabel had to stop Farah from auditioning. Gotta go, Fabel announced, interrupting the stellar performance. But it's getting late, and I have way too much to do. She tossed the pillow aside, scooped Spindle into her arms, then set him back inside the carrier. Farah gently landed on the carpet. But what about your monologue? You haven't found one yet. I already found it. I'm going to do the same monologue as you. Fabel grabbed the book from Farah's hand and took a photo of the page with her mirror phone. But instead of acting concerned or accusing Fabel of copying, Farah just smiled. Oh, that's a excellent idea, she said. I think it will be fun if we both do the same monologue. Of course she thought it would be fun, Fabel thought. She didn't have a competitive bone in her body, which is why she is doomed to lose. See you at the audition, Farah called as Fabel hurried down the hall. I hope I helped you. Oh, you've no idea how much you helped, Fabel thought. Chapter 9 The Vault of Lost Tales. After dinner that evening, Fabel flew to the charmatorium. She wanted to make sure no one else would be auditioning for her coveted role. The audition sign up sheet was tacked to the wall. Lots of students had added their names to the various roles, but only two names appeared for the Wicked Fairy Queen, Farah Good Fairy and Fabel Thorne. Excellent news. Even though Fabel had a ton of throne work to do that night, she had to find the time for an additional project. Like a true dark fairy, she would remedy this situation with Farah. If she could stop Farah from auditioning, then the role of the Wicked Fairy Queen would be hers. With Farah out of the running, Fabel wouldn't have to do anything but show up. 
She could recite some baby poem like Peter Peter Pumpkin Eater, and she'd still get the part. But could she keep Farah from auditioning? That was the all-important question. Threats and blackmail came to mind. But while those were acceptable villain tactics, they were also traceable. She couldn't risk getting dungeon detention, not when she had so much on her schedule. She'd have to eliminate her competition in a different way. She'd have to use dark magic. Fabel's mother had a favorite spell. She was fond of cursing those who displeased her. After sleeping for months, even years, on the front lawn, her victims would wake up, bleary-eyed and confused. This spell did wonders for instigating loyalty in her subjects. But it was well known, and if Fabel employed it, there would be finger-pointing for sure. She'd have to find something subtle, something that wouldn't announce dark magic at work. While most of the student body lingered in the cafeteria, eating dessert and chatting about everything that had happened during the school day, Fabel flew across campus to the one place that might provide her with an answer. The Vault of Lost Tales was aptly named because it contained books that had long been forgotten. What better place to find a spell that no one would recognize? There was a time when the vault had been locked up tight, off limits to most. But it was now open to students, though few chose to visit, not only because it was an eerie place, but also because the books within it weren't on any of the class lists. They'd been forgotten, after all. The vault was located far beneath the school, through a labyrinth of dank hallways and tunnels. There was no room to fly down there, so Fabel hurried along the stone floor. For some, the vault was a treasure trove, a place to discover books that had been buried, thrown away, or simply abandoned. For most, it was a dusty, moldy, and cold room with creepy decor, such as rat nests and bats. To make the place more unappealing was the rule that books discovered in the vault could not be checked out, for that would mean they'd been found and were no longer lost. So research had to be done within the vault itself. As Fabel entered, she inhaled a cobweb. Gross, she muttered. Somebody get some cleaning fairies down here. Once she stopped coughing, she looked around. Every shelf and most every inch of the stone floor was stacked with books. She'd been using her flashlight app on her mirror phone to light the way. Because there was no electricity beneath the school, a bin filled with candles and matches sat at the entrance. Open flame did not seem wise when there was so much paper about, but candlelight was tradition. Besides, it lent a mysterious glow to the place. Hello? Fabel called. The empty librarian's desk had a brass nameplate. Giles Grimm, librarian. He was probably at dinner, which is exactly what she'd hoped. She didn't want anyone asking her reason for visiting. The thing about lost books is that to remain lost, they cannot be cataloged. So there were no index cards to peruse, no database to search. It was a matter of walking the narrow aisles, looking and hoping for something to catch the eye. With a lit candle in one hand, she wound her way around towering stacks and started with a shelf at shoulder level. She eagerly ran her finger across book spines, reading the titles one by one. Mrs. Giant's Diary, Healthy Meals for Trolls, Fun Facts About Fangs. How utterly disappointing. Nothing sounded even remotely like dark magic. Of course, she could call her mother and ask for help. But Fabel wasn't a child any longer. She needed to solve her own problems. There was no pride in having one's mother come to the rescue. She was determined to fight her own battles. How proud the dark fairy would be when Fabel succeeded. The unmistakable sound of a page being turned caught Fabel's ear. Hello, she called again. 
She hurried to the end of the table, then groaned with disgust. What are you doing here? Raven Queen was sitting in the corner, wedged between two stacks of books. A long purple cloak was wrapped around her like a blanket. While the eerie vault did seem like the perfect place for a couple of future villains to hang out, Raven had proved that she wasn't villain material. So why was she here? Why wasn't she eating throne cakes in the castleteria with everyone else? Oh, hi, Faybell. She glanced up from a book she'd been reading. Aren't you cold? No. But in truth, Faybell was nearly shivering. Though her cheer-hexing uniform did a good job wicking away sweat, it couldn't protect her from the chilly air that inhabited the vault. Awkward silence ensued. They'd each journeyed to the bowels of Ever After High for a reason. Who would spill that reason first? It took about a minute for Faybell to win the staring match. Uh, I found this interesting book, Raven said. It's called My Life as a Toad. The author was a great, great, great uncle of Hopper Crokington II's. After his spell wore off, he wrote about his adventures. Faybell was dumbfounded. You're down here reading about a toad? Well, actually, I came down here to see if I could find something about misfiring spells, but I got distracted. She closed the book and got to her feet. I'm sure you've noticed that I sometimes have trouble with my good spells. I'm getting better, but I still need practice. You don't have to come down here to find the answer. Everybody knows what's wrong. What do you mean? Newsflash, you're not supposed to cast good spells. It goes against your destiny. It goes against your story. You don't need a book to tell you that. Fabel pointed a finger. Look in the mirror, Raven. You're the evil queen's daughter, and that's who you were meant to be. Not a good queen, an evil one. The evil one. Raven pulled her cloak tighter. I'm meant to be whomever I choose to be. Oh my godmother, more rebel talk. Fabel wanted to plug her ears. It pained her to hear such things. How can you be so, so, so what? So ungrateful, Fabel shouted angrily. She spun on her sneakers and stomped away, turning down the next aisle. There was nothing more to say to Raven. They stood on opposite sides of a huge divide, but Fabel knew that her side was the correct one. Forget about her, Fabel told herself. I came here to find something important, not to waste time thinking about Raven Queen. She began to peruse the next shelf. More ridiculous titles. Riddles about rodents. How to make a court jester hat. Trolls have feelings too. Whatever after. Yeesh. No wonder these books were lost and forgotten. Where was something about dark magic? You don't have to hate me. Huh? Fabel nearly jumped out of her tights. Raven had moved as silently as a shadow and was standing right next to her. You don't have to hate me just because I'm trying to choose a different path, Raven said. A whole mess of emotions flooded Fabel's head, and for a moment, she felt faint. Were they really going to have this conversation? Fabel had already made her opinion perfectly clear. What don't you get, she asked. Your mother and my mother are two of the most important, most powerful women in fairy tale history. You should be proud. You should want your destiny. Fabel pushed a strand of white blonde hair from her eyes. But you choose to be a rebel. How she hated even saying that word. Raven remained calm. Her violet eyes didn't flash. Her jaw didn't clench. Nor did she avert her gaze. But rather, she looked directly and confidently at Fabel. I'm not ashamed of my destiny. I love my mother as you love yours. But before you label me, ask yourself this. 
aren't we all rebels in some way? Don't you, Fabel Thorne, have some desire to go off book? Never, Fabel blurted. But as the word echoed off the ceiling, she knew it was a lie. If she extended the dark fairy's power and claimed the authority that once belonged to the evil queen, then she would be creating a new story. Then I guess you've got it all figured out. Raven looked at her mirror phone. Well, I'd better get back. I still have throne work. I hope you find whatever you're looking for. With a swish of her cloak, she turned and left the vault. Good riddance. Fabel pushed the conversation from her mind. She had a matter to contend with that was much more important than Raven Queen's insinuations. After a solid hour of fighting cobwebs, stirring up dust clouds, and shivering, Fabel finally found something. Her heart skipped a beat as she pulled the book from its home on the shelf. It was a small book, the size of a wallet. The pages were crumbling, and the binding had deteriorated so that the whole thing was being held together by a few stitches. Forgotten fairy spells. She gasped. This was unbelievable, exactly what she wanted. She sat on the nearest stack of books and carefully opened the cover. What an amazing find. The pages were handwritten in miniature letters. One of the diminutive fairies must have been the author. She held the candle close to the page, squinting to read. According to the introduction, these spells could only be cast by fairies and would only work on fairies. Perfect. But then, as she turned the pages, her hopes withered. Most of the spells were illegible, stained with mold, or missing passages because of rot. But one spell in the back of the book had survived intact. Wilted wing spell. Wings of beauty, soft and bright, droop and wilt, and bring no flight. Fabel's wings twitched, her fingers twitched too. The instructions said that the victim of the spell wouldn't be able to fly until a full passing of the moon. One month. This was even better than she'd hoped. If Farah's wings wilted, she wouldn't be able to fly. And Justine needed an actor who could fly. And because this was a forgotten fairy spell, the school administration wouldn't recognize it. They'd think Farah had some sort of illness that had caused her wings to wilt. It was brilliant and perfectly wicked. Fabel read and reread the spell until it was seared into memory. She tucked the book into a dark corner behind a stack, so it would remain forgotten. Then she ran out of the vault, her feet carrying her as swiftly as wings. Things were about to get delightfully evil. Chapter 10. A Deed Most Devious. The rest of the week passed quickly. Fabel kept up with her various duties. She wrote her speech for Villain Club. It started out as how being full of goodness impairs one's intelligence, but that got complicated, so she changed it to how being nice makes you stupid. She couldn't find any academic research to support this claim, so she used her own observations as examples. The speech got a standing ovation from her fellow villains. She also wrote a new cheer for regionals. Spell, say what, say what, spell, that's what we do, we spell, we spell for you. There was some discussion among team members, since not all of them could cast spells, and they were worried that the audience might think they were talking about spelling, as in spelling words. So Fabel had the fairies release puffs of fairy dust at the end to make it clear they were talking about magic. And even though they'd had a few tumbles, the inverted pyramid was coming along nicely. In addition, Fabel completed all her throne work assignments, 
took Spindle for daily walks, kept her wings in tip-top condition, and maintained an air of superiority. But all the while, she kept that forgotten wilted wing spell in mind. She'd unleash it at the perfect moment. Thera would be foiled. Poor little thing wouldn't know what hit her. But there was no reason to feel sorry for Farah. In one month, she'd be fine again, back to normal. It's not like wilted wings would be such a big deal to her because she walked most of the time. At least, that was what Fabel told herself every time she tried to imagine what it might be like to have wilted wings. Saturday finally arrived. Auditions were at noon. You look different, Bunny said. Where's your uniform? I can't wear a cheer-hexing uniform for a theater audition. That would be idiotic. Fabel stood in front of her full-length mirror. She'd chosen a white dress that was accented with tiny crystals. She'd also selected a pair of glittery shoes. When light hit her, she glowed. Light is power, her mother had often told her. Never hide in the shadows. What about a hat? Bunny was particularly fond of a black top hat. A hat is one of the most necessary accessories. A hat? Fabel scowled. Those Wonderlandians were always talking about tea and hats. Why would a queen wear a hat? Then she realized what was missing. A crown, of course. She opened the closet and searched the shelves until she found a tiara made of crystal thorns. She plopped it onto her head. The outfit was complete. She didn't thank Bunny for the suggestion. After all, a crown was not a hat. Will you watch Spindle while I'm gone? Sure, Bunny said. I'll take him for a walk. Fabel handed the leash and a bag of treats to Bunny. Then she kissed Spindle's fluffy head. He wagged his tail and kissed her back. Break a leg, Bunny called as Fabel flew from the room. Nervous energy coursed through her, which was odd. Fabel was used to performing in front of crowds. She'd given plenty of speeches, and she'd led her cheer hexers countless times. But she was so jittery, it felt as if actual pixies were trapped inside her stomach. Was that even possible? Had someone cast a spell on her? Of course not. She was being paranoid. It was normal to feel a bit nervous before using dark magic. At least, that was what she told herself. Her plan was this. Just before Farah delivered her monologue, Fabel would cast the spell. Unable to fly, Farah would give up, and Fabel would swoop in and show Justine how a real wicked fairy queen commanded the stage. Then she'd call her mother and share the good news. The dark fairy would be so proud. Students were milling outside the charmatorium. Some were practicing monologues, others were chatting. As soon as Fabel landed on the steps, Blondie Locks stuck a mirror pad in her face. The red recording light was flashing. Hi, Fabel, she said. I was hoping to get an interview before the audition. Did you know that most of my viewers are predicting a landslide win for Farah? Fabel glowered at the perky reporter. This isn't an election. Who cares what your viewers think? She flicked her wings, sending a gust of air right into Blondie's face. Blondie coughed. But do you agree with them? Do you think Farah stands a better chance? No comment. But as she fluttered up the steps, she realized that her coldness could draw suspicion later, when everyone was trying to figure out why Farah's wings had wilted. So Fabel turned back around. Oh, Blondie, she called with a little wave. Blondie held up the mirror pad. I wish Farah the very best, and I know that Justine will be fair in her selection. It took every ounce of focus not to cringe after saying those words. What a load of Pegasus poop.
She waved again and forced a smile. Wow, maybe she was a talented actor after all. Blondie smiled back. It was crowded inside the lobby, but a chorus of familiar voices drew her attention. Faybelle, there she is. Faybelle, Faybelle, she's the one. She's the one who makes auditions fun. Stop pushing me. You stop pushing me. Her six cheer hexers shoved and elbowed their way around the other students until they were standing next to their captain. Each was sipping from a hocus latte cup. For you, one of them said, handing Fabel a mocha frappe, her favorite. You look amazing. So amazing. You deserve this part. You so deserve this part. Stop mirroring me. You stop mirroring me. Okay, enough, Fabel said. She took a sip. Maybe the sweet beverage would settle her stomach. Now, you know what you're supposed to do, right? She'd given them specific instructions after practice yesterday. Yes, we're supposed to clap. Extra loud. And cheer. When you're done with your audition. But we don't clap or cheer for anyone else. Only you. Fabel nodded. Having her own fan club was extremely convenient. She checked her mirror phone. It was almost noon. Let's go, team. Like a flock of birds, they flew across the lobby. Students jumped out of the way. Whoa, Humphrey Dumpty called as he wobbled, nearly falling over. The Charmatorium was one of the most impressive rooms at Ever After High. Hundreds of seats faced a gilded stage. The stage was graced by blue velvet curtains. There were plush box seats and dozens of golden chandeliers. Fabel and her cheer hexers chose seats in the front row, center. Fabel glanced around until she spotted Farah sitting next to Briar and Ashlyn, a few rows behind them. Farah hadn't dressed like a wicked queen. She looked as she always did, with her blue dress and blue hair. She waved. Fabel forced herself to wave back. If the audition was based on appearance alone, Fabel would definitely get the part. But alas, that was not how it worked. There were other familiar faces as well, such as Dexter and Daring Charming. Farah's roommate, Michelle, was there too, along with a bunch of students from the Glee Club. Humphrey hurried in, followed by some student dancers. Justine took the stage. Welcome, everyone, she said, clipboard in hand. Her denim jacket had director embroidered on the back. Welcome to the auditions for Once Upon a Spell. If you're here for Fabulous Flutes tryouts, they've been moved to room 201. A couple of kids with flutes scrambled out of their seats and left. Justine continued. I speak for everyone in the theater club when I say we're excited to see so many new faces. I hope you're not nervous. We are all friends here, so please don't worry too much. There are lots of parts, and if you don't get a lead, I can find room for you in the chorus or on the dance team. We're all friends, Fabel thought. She held back a snicker. That's what you think. So this is how we'll proceed. First, we'll have auditions for the melancholy princess and the forgetful prince, the elderly king, and then for the wicked fairy queen. Then we'll take a break and audition for the remaining roles. Each actor will come up here and deliver a two-minute monologue. Callbacks will be next week. Callbacks? Fabel blurted. Justine squinted. Fabel's gown was glowing beneath the charmatorium chandeliers. There will be callbacks in case I can't make up my mind. I will narrow it down to two actors, and they will come back to audition a second time. There are lots of students auditioning, so I might have trouble deciding. For instance, there are ten girls trying out for the melancholy princess. Ten? Fabel grumbled, then sank low in her chair. This was going to take all day. She stretched her legs and rested her feet on the edge of the stage. Okay, let's begin, Justine said, reading from her clipboard. First up is Briar Beauty. 
Fabel watched as, one by one, the actors took the stage. Briar was okay, but she kept yawning. Ashlyn was really good. Michelle seemed a little nervous at first, but midway through her performance, she seemed to gain confidence and pulled off a good audition. Who knew Fish could act? Fabel whispered to the cheer hexer on her left, who hexted the comment to the other cheer hexers. They all giggled. As the auditions continued, the cheer hexers paid no attention, hexting one another to pass the time. Fabel went over the spell in her mind again and again. Seven guys tried out for the part of the forgetful prince. Dexter Charming and Daring Charming both auditioned. Dexter, like Michelle, lacked confidence, so his voice was hard to hear. But his performance didn't improve midway through. If anything, he seemed to get more nervous. Daring, however, strode all over the stage, blinding everyone with his smile. He was certain to get the lead. He even forgot his lines, which was perfect for the part. Humphrey Dumpty was the last to try out. Sure, he was a prince in real life, but Fabel couldn't imagine him being cast as a leading man. He was a tech geek who was always tripping on stuff. He'd end up in the chorus for sure. What an epic bore, Fabel whispered under her breath. You're so right. Extremely boring. Total torture. Fairy fail. Makes me want to go all evil queen. Get your elbow off my armrest. Okay, next up, we have the role of the wicked fairy queen, Justine said. Fabel sat up straight. She'd been so focused on her spell, she hadn't even noticed that the tryouts for the elderly king had passed. There are three names on the list, so we'll begin with, excuse me? Fabel leaped to her feet. What do you mean, three? It's supposed to be just me and Farah. Justine read her clipboard again. It looks like a new name was added this morning. What the hex? Someone had dared add her name to the audition sheet? Who would do such a thing? Fabel looked around the room, at each gilded chair, even up in the balcony. Her gaze landed on two fairies who were sitting in the back row. She didn't know them. They were first years. Which one was auditioning? Drat! The spell was designed to wilt the wings of only one fairy. Now she'd have to eliminate two fairies. Her thoughts spun as she tried to figure out what to do. And then, the perfect solution popped into her head. She'd have to cheer hex the spell to increase its potency. Give me those, she said, grabbing a pair of pom-poms. I gotta do something. We'll come with you, the cheer hexer said in unison. No, stay here, she hissed as she lifted into the air. Justine shielded her eyes with her hand. Fabel, where are you going? You're up first. Uh, I need to make an important call. Let Farah go first. I'll be right back. And out the door she flew. After landing in the lobby, Fabel closed the charmatorium doors behind her. Fortunately, the lobby was empty. Something else must have caught Blondie's attention because she wasn't hanging around waiting for a scoop. There was no time to waste. Farah would soon be on the stage, delivering her perfect monologue, proving to everyone that she could act. Pom-poms in hand, Fabel cheered the spell. Wings of beauty, rustle, rustle, soft and bright, rustle, rustle, droop and wilt, stomp, stomp, and bring no flight, stomp, stomp. She aimed the fairy dust at the charmatorium. The dust swirled, then disappeared through the crack beneath the door. She lowered her pom-poms and took a long breath. The devious deed was done. There was no going back. If regret, worry, or guilt tickled her conscience, it was too late. She'd cast dark magic at a fellow student. It shouldn't take too long. A fairy would notice immediately if her wings, 
A heart-wrenching cry arose from inside the charmatorium. Chapter 11 Wilted Wings Fabel tossed the pom-poms aside. She didn't want anything to arouse suspicion. When she stepped back into the charmatorium, she would prove to everyone that she was, without a doubt, a natural-born performer. She would astonish them all with her ability to act as if she knew absolutely nothing about Farah's wilted wings. She opened the doors. What in ever after is going on? She asked as innocently as possible. Did something happen while I was on my mirror phone? She batted her lashes and put her hand to her heart as if concerned. Oh, she was good. Farah stood alone on stage, all color drained from her face. My, my, my wings, she stammered. She spun around. They won't unfurl. She spun again, her long blue hair twirling with her. What's wrong with them? This has never happened. A strangled whimper escaped her lips. I don't understand. I, I... She turned and looked imploringly at Fabel. What's wrong with me? Fabel shrugged. How should I know? I wasn't anywhere near you when this happened. She said this loudly so everyone in the charmatorium could hear. You're not accusing me of anything, are you? She clenched her jaw, ready to defend herself if necessary. If magic was suspected, she'd point to the other fairies in the room. They were as capable of casting a spell as she was. No, of course not. Farah's eyes seemed as wide as tea saucers. But my wings aren't working. Do you know what it could be? Has this ever happened to you? Poor misguided creature. She wasn't accusing Fabel. She was looking to her for advice. Fabel flew onto the stage and stood next to the little good fairy. It was the perfect opportunity to showcase her superior physical attributes. She took her time strutting around Farah, pretending to inspect Farah's wings. But in truth, she was giving Justine time to observe the difference between the two fairies. I'm taller, stronger, and much more regal, Fabel thought. The choice is obvious. I'm your wicked fairy queen. My, my, this is a mystery, Fabel said, feigning confusion as she touched one of the limp wings. The sight of the stricken appendages was indeed shocking. For a moment, Fabel's chest felt a little heavy. She wondered if she'd done the right thing. But then she pushed that thought from her mind. She made some tisk tisk sounds. I have no idea why your wings are just hanging there. It's so unattractive. My wings always work. To prove her point, she lifted off the stage and soared over the audience, skimming their heads. Ashlyn and Briar ducked. Humphrey fell out of his chair. The cheer hexers cheered. Fabel, 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 she can fly. She can fly up to the, hey, Watch your elbow. You watch your elbow. Fabel landed back on stage. Farah was visibly trembling, her eyes filling with tears. A lump formed in Fabel's throat. What was going on? Was she feeling bad for this good fairy? No, never. A dark fairy does not feel bad about casting dark magic. Justine hurried onto the stage. I'm so sorry this has happened, she said, wrapping her arm around Farah's shoulder. Do you think you'll get better if you take a break or go get a drink of water? I could try, Farah said, but fairies never lose the ability to fly, unless they are extremely ill. Gasps arose in the audience. She's right, Fabel said, extremely ill. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Farah told Justine. You said you needed someone who can fly, and if I can't fly, I can't audition for the wicked fairy queen. 
but you still have two others who are trying out. That's right, Faybell said. She zipped around them, then hovered. My wings are just fine, but I don't know about the other. A shriek erupted from the back row, then another. Faybell could barely contain her smirk. What's going on? Justine called. The two first-year fairies had leaped from their seats. My wings, one of them cried. Something's wrong with my wings. My wings, too. They struggled down the row, pushing past other students until they burst into the aisle. Then they both spun around, trying to unfurl their wings. But both sets hung limp and lifeless. Well, this is going exactly as planned, Fabel thought. She rubbed her hands together in a most satisfied way. Then she opened her mouth, about to tell Justine she was ready for her monologue, when her six cheer hexers also jumped from their seats. They didn't cheer. They shrieked and wailed as they also discovered useless wings. Fabel, they cried. Fabel, what's happening? Holy hex. She'd been in such a hurry to foil Farah and the other auditioning fairy, she'd forgotten that the spell would attack every fairy in the room. Panic welled in her chest. Her heart began to pound. Her wings beat in double time as she continued to hover. How could she have made such a rookie mistake? This would be a huge problem for the cheer hexing squad. Regionals were three weeks away, but the wilted wing spell was supposed to last for an entire moon cycle. How could they fly in formation? She'd sabotaged her own team. The weight of what she'd done pressed down on her shoulders, pushing her until she was standing on the stage. Oh, you poor dears, Farah said. She hurried off the stage and ran up the aisle. Oh dear, oh dear, she said as she took a closer look at everyone's wings. We've all been struck by some mysterious illness. This is terrible. Fix them, one of the cheer hexers demanded. That's what you do, right? You make things look better. Oh, what a good idea. I can try. As Farah took her little wand from her pocket, Fabel cringed. While she wanted her cheer hexers fixed, she didn't want Farah or the other auditioning fairy to recover. Could fairy godmother magic actually fix a dark spell? Farah pointed her wand at one of the cheer hexers. A trail of music and sparkle shot out the wand's end, and for a moment, everyone held their breath, waiting to see what would happen. The wings remained limp. Farah's face fell. I'm sorry. My fairy godmother magic doesn't seem to work in this situation. Fabel exhaled with relief. The audition was still hers. But the cheer hexing problem remained. How could she solve that? I wonder if it's some kind of virus, said Dexter Charming. He stepped into the aisle and pushed his glasses up his nose. Viruses spread quickly. That would explain how so many of you got it at the same time. A virus? Justine asked. It makes sense, Farah said. All this chit chat is a waste of time, Fabel thought. Hey, Justine, do you expect me to stand here all day? Let's do this. Silence fell over the charmatorium. Everyone turned and stared at Fabel. She realized her mistake. She'd let her guard down. She'd forgotten to act as if she cared. Did they suspect? Hey, how come your wings are working? One of the cheer hexers asked. Yeah, how come? Fabel held back a gulp. She flicked her wings. There is a perfectly adequate explanation. She took a few steps forward. Dark fairies have superior immune systems. Centuries of dealing with dark magic have made us stronger than other fairies. That does make sense, Dexter said with a nod. This seemed to satisfy the cheer hexers. Besides, they'd never dare question their team captain and future queen, at least not in public. 
or to her face. Farah tucked away her wand. I think we should go to the infirmary. Maybe there's some medicine we can take. I shall escort you, fairy damsels, Daring cried. He leaped across the seats and bounded into the aisle. Then with a bow, he said in his most dashing voice, Follow me. Farah and the other fairies followed, along with Ashlyn, Briar, and Michelle, who wanted to help in whatever way they could. Finally, good riddance. Fabel cleared her throat. Are you ready? Justine took her seat. Yes, I guess we'd better get back to business. Go ahead. Fabel delivered the monologue, the same one Farah would have delivered if she hadn't been sabotaged. She took her time walking around the stage, allowing everyone to admire her costume. Then she stood in the center, hands on hips, and, for maximum visual impact, she unfurled her wings in slow motion. They stood magnificent, catching the spotlights, casting rainbows upon the walls. And then she flew around the stage, delivering her lines, condemning the king and queen for not sending an invitation. As the monologue concluded, she cursed the princess to prick her finger and sleep for a hundred years. There was nary a doubt in Fabel's mind. The part was hers. Confidence coursed through her. She took a long bow. Since her cheer hexers had left, there was no fervent applause. A few members of the audience seemed to appreciate her performance, but most looked wary, unsure of how to react. Did they suspect her of foul play? Or did they think her performance was foul? Or was that fear she saw in their eyes? When does practice begin? She asked Justine. I'm busy most afternoons with the cheer hexing squad, but I can squeeze in time after dinner. Justine held up her clipboard and pointed to another name. You don't have the part yet. There's still one more person trying out. Fabel snorted. She left with the other fairies, remember? No, I didn't, a voice called. I'm still here. Because the spotlight was blinding her, Fabel couldn't see who was speaking. She shielded her eyes with her hand and stepped to the edge of the stage. You have to be a fairy to try out for the wicked fairy queen, she said, her eyes scanning the faces. She doesn't have to be a fairy, Justine corrected. She simply has to have wings and be able to fly. Not a fairy? What treachery was this? Who else had wings? Who else could fly? This was impossible. Then Fabel's gaze stopped cold on a smiling face. See a Cupid. Chapter 12 Greek Tragedy Fabel Thorne hadn't felt this angry since that time everyone in the dorm but her got an invitation to the spring fairest, or that time Lizzie Hartz's hedgehog chewed up her throne work, or that time the dragon cleaner shrank her cheer hexing uniform, or that time. Okay, so perhaps she had a hot temper, but at that moment, it had risen beyond the boiling point. She could barely contain herself. She wanted to go all evil on everyone. But instead, she took a seat in the very back row, where no one could see her clenched jaw or blazing eyes. C.A. Cupid stood on the stage, delivering some boring monologue. Curses! The wilted wing spell only worked on fairies, not on whatever Cupid was. What was she, exactly? An adopted daughter of a Greek demigod? Whatever after. And what was up with all that pink? Pink hair, pink lip gloss, pink dress, pink shoes, and a big pink heart on top of her head. So much cuteness was nauseating. But aside from Cupid's questionable color obsession, the point was she wasn't a fairy. Why would Justine allow a non-fairy to try out for such an important role? And to make the situation even more insulting, Cupid was the opposite of a villain. 
Her father was the god of love. Her destiny was to spread love to people. That was why she was always trying to matchmake everyone on campus. She had a mirror cast show the cheerhexers were always watching called Love Advice. Cupid's brilliant advice was that people should follow their hearts. Well, I've got news for you, Fabel whispered. I am following my heart, and my heart wants this part. If Fabel hadn't been seething with rage, she might have noticed that Cupid wasn't much of an actor. Her delivery was okay, just not great. But though her wings were smaller than Fabel's and solid rather than translucent, she could fly. Justine seemed very pleased. Thanks so much, Justine said, taking the stage once again. She wrote something on her clipboard. Let's take a break, everyone. Then we'll audition the rest of the parts. Wait, Fabel said, scooting to the edge of her seat. Who gets to play the wicked fairy queen? I'll post the callback list tomorrow, Justine told her. But only two of us auditioned. Why do we have to audition again? That doesn't make sense. You should decide now, me or Cupid. Well, Justine hesitated. I'd like to wait and see what the doctor says. If Farah is going to get better, then I'd like to give her the chance to try out. I think that's fair, don't you? Yes, Cupid said, smiling at Justine. I think that's super fair. Fabel blinked. Fair? Her fingers twitched, eager to deliver a bolt of magic. Oh, yes, we must be fair. She glared at Cupid. If looks could kill, there would have been an explosion of pink on the stage. That little demigoddess had ruined everything. What a waste. All that time in the vault of lost tales, searching through those crumbling books, inhaling dust. She was still picking cobwebs off her uniform. All that trouble, and she had to compete against a non-fairy. It was too much to bear. She was so filled with emotion that she felt she might burst. She needed to release some magic, she realized. Releasing just a little bit of magic would make her feel better. She looked around the charmatorium to make sure no one was watching, and then she pointed her finger. She'd sear a hole in the seat in front of her, just a little dust, just a little poof. No one would get hurt. But someone did get hurt. What Fabel didn't realize was that when she'd cheer hexed the wilted wing spell, she'd created magic so powerful that remnants had been left behind, a small dusting that still lingered on her finger. So when she released a jolt of fairy dust, it didn't sear a hole in the seat back. Instead, the magic ricocheted off the seat back and hit her in the chest. Wham! Huh? Her back suddenly felt heavy, as if she were strapped to a book-filled backpack. What the hex? As it dawned on her what might have happened, she slowly got to her feet. No way, she said. I did not just. She unfurled her wings. But the wings that she loved, the wings that she carefully tended and groomed, would not obey her command. Chapter 13 Flight Grounded Fabel almost burst into tears, but she didn't. She maintained her cool demeanor. While Justine and the other students headed to the vending machines for their break, Fabel walked down the row, up the aisle, and into the lobby. She'd pretend nothing had happened. No one would know that her wings didn't work. No one would see her in this weakened state. Never. If word of this got around, she'd be forever after humiliated. To allow a spell to backfire would elicit comparisons to Raven Queen. That was an insult she couldn't bear. And if Justine found out that Fabel couldn't fly, she'd give the role of the Wicked Fairy Queen to Cupid. 
A demigoddess playing a fairy queen? Not on Fabel's watch. As she stepped out of the building, the afternoon air felt different. It was a pleasant temperature, as usual, and tinged with the scent of warm cobblestones and buttercups. But the air did not embrace her as it usually did. It did not call to her, welcome her, or lift her. Without the buoyancy of her wings, she might as well have been wearing boulders on her feet. She was grounded, like a tree, like a mountain. How could the wingless stand this lack of freedom? Ms. Thorn, the bellowing voice was unmistakable and could not be ignored. What now? Fabel grumbled to herself. She wanted to find some place private, some place to gather her thoughts and process the situation. But the school's headmaster was walking straight for her. Headmaster Grimm was very tall, which was why he often looked down his nose at his students. He had quite a lot of hair for a man of his advanced years, and his thick mustache was streaked with white. He bore a gentlemanly look, reminiscent of bygone days when men were dapper and ladies elegant. The heavy key ring hanging from his belt symbolized his authority, for only he possessed the keys for many secret and forbidden rooms. Hello, headmaster, Fabel said. She folded her arms behind her back, hoping to hide the droopy wings. You called? She kept her voice calm, her gaze confident. But her mind reeled. Had she been found out? What would the punishment be? Dungeon detention, surely. Every good villain expected to be sent to dungeon detention on a regular basis. But if the headmaster tried to impose another kind of punishment, should she defend her actions? Her excuse was straightforward. A villain was supposed to act like a villain. A villain was supposed to pursue her destiny. And the headmaster was a firm believer in respecting one's destiny. He'd installed signs all over campus to remind students of this fact. We are the children of destiny. No, she couldn't confess. She'd have to play dumb. She could never admit that she'd become a victim of her own dark magic. The headmaster halted. Then he looked up and waved. Miss Cupid, I require your presence as well. Fabel cringed as Cupid landed next to her. Hello, Headmaster Grimm, she said. Do you need some love advice? While I am a fan of your mirror cast show, I am much too busy for matters of the heart. He smoothed his vest. Ms. Thorne and Ms. Cupid, I just got off the mirror phone with Madame Baba Yaga. She would like both of you to report to the infirmary. I can't go, Fabel explained. I have a meeting of the villain club. While I appreciate your dedication to your extracurricular activities, Ms. Thorne, this is not open for debate. He raised his bushy eyebrows. A mysterious wing ailment has spread among some students, and you must both be checked out. Do not delay. This appears to be very serious. Serious? Oh, that's terrible news, Cupid said. I'll go right now. I don't need to go, Fabel insisted. And why is that, Miss Thorne? Do you believe you are impervious to disease? Have you ever seen a dark fairy get sick, she asked. Cupid shifted her little golden bow onto her other shoulder. I get sick sometimes. Last year during holiday, I caught Athenian acne. It lasted for a whole week. And one time I came down with the Herculean flu. All the ambrosia in the world couldn't make me feel better. Fabel's wings might have twitched with annoyance, except they were currently as lifeless as woolen drapes. May I be excused from this super interesting conversation? I have so many things to do. Did she dare call her mother and ask for help? Surely the dark fairy would know how to undo magic. But Fabel had wanted to pull off this scheme on her own, to make her mother proud with her success, not disappoint her with failure. You may not be excused, Headmaster Grimm said. 
This is a strange ailment that we have never before encountered. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance that all winged students undergo an examination. That is why I am instructing you to go to the infirmary. He did not use the word ordering, but that was his meaning. As the headmaster, he was the final decision maker. With a swift turn on his heels, he strode toward his office. Fabel groaned. This is all your fault, she grumbled at Cupid. She started across the quad, fists clenched, teeth grinding. If Cupid hadn't signed up to audition, Fabel wouldn't have been forced to add the cheer factor to her spell, and she'd be with her team, celebrating her victory at this very moment. Stupid Cupid. An invasion of pink appeared out the corner of her eye. C.A. Cupid was walking beside her. What are you, my shadow? We're going to the same place, so I thought it would be nice to walk together, Cupid said sweetly. You seem upset. Your powers of observation are astounding. You're worried about your friends, aren't you? You and your teammates are very close. Yeah, that's it. I'm worried about my friends. Fabel wanted to zap her with a dizzy spell and send her spinning to the ground. But there were too many witnesses milling about. How could she get rid of this pink problem? Cupid ducked behind Fabel, then reappeared. Is there something wrong with your wings? No. Really? They look kinda. Kinda what? Fabel stopped walking and pointed a finger at Cupid. Kinda what? Cupid shrugged. Different. I'm tired, that's all. I stayed up late memorizing my monologue. Fabel needed to deflect the conversation away from her wings. What makes you think you can play the role of the wicked fairy queen better than I can play it? She demanded. Oh, I'd never think that, Cupid said, her cheeks turning as pink as her dress. Never, you were amazing. But Justine said she needed an actor who could fly, so I thought I should try out. I really don't care what part I get. If you don't care, then drop out. I don't want to drop out. I do want to be in the play. If Justine casts me as the Wicked Fairy Queen, then I'll be happy to play that part. But if I get a part in the chorus, that will be fine too. She ran her hand along her bow. Theater is a huge tradition back home, except all the plays are kind of depressing, all that Greek tragedy. I prefer love stories. Of course you do. The day was beginning to feel like a Greek tragedy. Everything was going wrong. Fabel was supposed to be the hero of her own story, but this hero was not getting what she wanted. What kind of stories do you like? Cupid asked. The kind that ends with me in charge. I don't have time for stories. Why was it taking so long to get to the infirmary? Walking was the slowest, most tedious means of travel ever invented. Cupid kept jabbering. I think you might be one of the busiest students on campus. I've watched you hurrying between practice and meetings, but you never seem super happy. Is there something missing in your life? In case you hadn't noticed, Cupid, I'm not a guest on your mirror cast show, so quit trying to analyze me. And in case you just woke up from a sleeping spell, I'm a villain. Villains aren't supposed to be super happy. We fester, we dwell, we're prone to years of melancholy. You know, proper villain emotions. But villains still feel love, right? Fabel stopped walking again. They'd reached the stone steps that led to the infirmary. What are you getting at? Well, Cupid raised her eyebrows. Do you have love in your life? I don't have time for love, Fabel snorted. Love makes you crazy. It makes you weak. Her gaze darted to the top step where Ashlyn and Hunter were sitting. His arm was wrapped around her shoulders. They were whispering. Love distracts you from the important stuff. I think love is important stuff, 
Cupid said. But Fabel didn't care about Cupid's opinion. She marched up the steps, and as she did, Ashlyn and Hunter stood. Professor Yaga's in there, examining the fairies, Ashlyn told her. She doesn't know what's wrong with them. She said she doesn't have a cure. What are we going to do about regionals? Hunter asked. Do you think we'll have to forfeit? No, Fabel said firmly. Champions never forfeit. And while she believed that with every cell in her body, she had no idea how she was going to fix the mess she'd made. She reached out and grabbed Hunter's cloak, which was lying on the steps. I need to borrow this. With Cupid at her heels, she entered the infirmary. Chapter 14 Boiling Blood Even though it was plenty warm inside the stone building, Fabel flung Hunter's cloak over her shoulders and attached it at her neck. It hung all the way to her shins, more than enough fabric to cover her wilted wings. The infirmary was an old-fashioned name for the student clinic. Small nurse fairies tended the facility's patients, applying bandages, dispensing medicine, mending broken bones, that sort of stuff. Farah, the two first-year fairies, and the six cheerhexers were sitting on benches in the waiting room. The cheerhexers didn't cheer Fabel's entrance as they usually did. They all sat listless, shoulders drooping, expressions heavy with worry. No twinkle in their eyes, no sparkle in their presence. They were the saddest bunch of fairies Fabel had ever seen. Hi, Fabel. Hi, Cupid, Farah said. What are you doing here? Headmaster Grimm sent us, Cupid explained. We're supposed to get our wings examined. The blue in Farah's eyes had dulled. They looked gray. Oh, I hope you're not sick, she said. Of course I'm not sick, Fabel insisted. We're waiting for our results, Farah explained. She held a cotton ball to her index finger. They took a drop of blood for a blood test. Madame Baba Yaga stood at the end of the hall. Slightly hunched over, she beckoned with a gnarled finger. Miss Thorne, Miss Cupid, this way, please. The girls joined the professor in an examination room. A nurse fairy stuck a thermometer in Cupid's mouth, while another wrapped a blood pressure cuff around her arm. We must take your vital signs, Madame Baba Yaga explained. Take a seat, Miss Thorne, and wait your turn. This is a waste of everyone's time because I'm not sick, Fabel insisted. As Madame Baba Yaga supervised, a nurse fairy pricked Cupid's finger and placed a drop of blood into a little vial. Madame Baba Yaga held the vial up to her nose. She sniffed it. She added a pinch of green powder, then murmured some magical words. The blood did not respond. Didn't you hear me, Fabel said huffily. I'm not sick. That remains to be seen. Madame Baba Yaga inspected Cupid's wings with a magnifying glass. Are they working as usual? She asked. Oh, yes, Cupid said. I would have flown here, but Fabel was walking, so I walked with her. My wings are perfect. To demonstrate, she lifted herself off the floor and fluttered around the room. Indeed. Madame Baba Yaga wrote some notes in a file. You may be excused, Ms. Cupid. It would appear that you are not affected. Okay, thanks. Cupid hurried toward the door, but then turned. Good luck, Fabel. Fabel paced like a caged beast. She began to sweat beneath the cloak. You appear to be a bit agitated, Madame Baba Yaga observed. I'm not agitated, Fabel bellowed. Madame Baba Yaga stared at the cloak. Then she waved her hand at the nurse fairies. Leave us, she told them. They flitted from the room. The door closed, and Fabel and the professor were alone. A bead of sweat rolled down Fabel's nose. 
Wouldn't you be more comfortable without that heavy cloak? The professor asked. No, it's the latest style. I love it. Really? Yes, really. In fact, I'm going to call the tailor at Fairy Fashion and Finery and order a dozen more. She wiped the sweat with the back of her hand. I'll go do that right now. She started toward the door, but Madame Baba Yaga blocked her path. Ms. Thorne, I do not have to inspect your wings to know that they have been wilted. She pulled a twig from her matted hair, and using its blunt end, she scratched the back of her neck. My eyes may be old and bloodshot, but I can clearly see that you've lost your sparkle. Was this true? Fabel looked in a mirror that hung above the examination room sink. She did look different. Her skin was less luminous. Her eyes were dull. She looked, oh, horror of horrors. Could it be true? She looked ordinary. Madame Baba Yaga tossed the twig aside, then picked up another file. Fabel's name was written on the file's cover. You have no record of illness, she said, aside from a few bumps and bruises from cheer hexing. Yet here you are, along with nine other fairies, stricken by a mysterious ailment. Is there something you'd like to tell me? Fabel turned away from the mirror. Like what? She wasn't lying, just playing dumb. Madame Baba Yaga plucked the vial from the counter. Cupid's drop of blood wobbled from the movement. When coming into contact with the magic detection powder, Ms. Cupid's blood remained unaltered. However, she picked up a different vial. It also contained a drop of blood. She sprinkled green powder into the vial. The drop began to boil. A puff of black steam shot out the top. This blood shows clear signs that it has recently been exposed to dark magic. This blood belongs to Ms. Good Fairy. Really? Fabel examined her nails. How dreadfully uninteresting. Another bead of sweat trailed down her neck. If the professor wanted a confession, she'd have to try much harder. Do you remember my advice on cheer hexing? I clearly told you not to use your magic touch unwisely. I advised you to hone your skills slowly. Broken teacups are one thing, but attacking your fellow fairies. I didn't attack them, Fabel blurted. They stood in silence for a moment. The cloak was smothering. Fabel needed fresh air. She backed up until her legs came into contact with the edge of a chair. Then she sat. She wanted to crumple into a ball. Her wings felt so heavy. Her heart felt heavy too. When Madame Baba Yaga spoke, her voice was gentle. The spell will wear off? Yes, Fabel admitted in a moon span. Good. The professor washed the vials in the sink. I'm curious, Miss Thorne. What was your motive for attacking fellow students? To eliminate my competition. I see. She nodded, but she didn't look like she approved. You will refrain from magic until this situation is resolved. No magic? Fabel gasped. Do not press your luck, Miss Thorne. Fabel went silent. No magic, none at all. Do you understand? Fabel groaned. Yes. The punishment could have been much worse. She could have been expelled, but still, no magic felt harsh. Madame Baba Yaga opened the examination room door. There are times in life, Ms. Thorne, when magic is not necessary, when the terms of competition should be fair and square. A villain doesn't fight fair and square, Fabel said. A villain does what she has to do to win. Madame Baba Yaga pressed her fingertips together and gave Fabel a knowing look. 
Sometimes it is the victory won fairly that proves to be the most rewarding. But, alas, here you are. No role in the play. No regionals. No flight. Whatever after, Fabel grumbled as she wrapped the cloak around her shoulders and trudged away. She'd deal with this in her own way. Her own wicked way. Chapter 15 Dark Fairy Discussion Madame Baba Yaga told the fairies that their wings would recover in a moon span. Four weeks, the cheer hexers cried. What about regionals? We can't compete with regular cheers. How embarrassing. We're famous for our flying formations. What are we going to do? They looked beseechingly at their leader. Fabel put her hands on her hips. Who am I? She asked them. Fabel Thorne, daughter of the Dark Fairy. That's correct. So stop all your whining and have some confidence. I will figure this out, and we will claim that trophy. Because the wilted wing sickness wasn't contagious, the fairies were allowed to leave the infirmary and were told to go about life as usual. But that was impossible, for there was nothing usual about being earthbound. The sky was calling, but the fairies could not answer. The situation was the hot topic on Blondie's mirror cast show that evening. It hadn't taken long for Blondie to get the scoop. Being in the know about everything, she reported that Fabel had been infected. Had Cupid told her? Possibly. But Blondie never revealed her secret sources. Or was it simply that Fabel couldn't hide the truth? It was obvious she had no flight. And covering her wings with Hunter's cloak only drew attention to the matter, like a bald guy trying to cover his scalp with an ill-fitting toupee. But even though everyone knew, Fabel couldn't bear to have them stare at her wings. So she tossed Hunter's cloak aside and chose a shimmering cape she'd worn to a masquerade ball last year. At least it didn't make her sweat. What does this mean for your original play, Once Upon a Spell? Blondie asked Justine during her show. Well, callbacks are tomorrow afternoon, Justine said. If neither Fabel nor Farah gets better, it looks like the part of the Wicked Fairy Queen will be going to Cupid. I just hope Cupid doesn't get sick. I really need a flying actor. Blondie looked into the camera. Did you hear that, Cupid? Take your vitamins and get plenty of sleep. You can't get sick, or Justine's play will be an epic fairy fail. Fabel turned off her mirror pad. Too bad there wasn't some sort of fairy tale flu spreading across campus. And too bad she'd been forbidden to use magic. She could steal Cupid's voice, but make it look like laryngitis. She could shoot pixie music into her ear and make it seem like an earache. But even if she could use magic, it would be foolish to attack Cupid. Madame Baba Yaga would figure it out. She'd punish Fabel. Everyone would know. And Fabel would never get the role. Oh, to be wingless and magicless was torture. How did ordinary students stand it? Somehow, some way, she would keep Cupid from going to callbacks. Better yet, she'd persuade Cupid to drop out of the play entirely. Then Justine would be forced to wait for the wilted wing spell to wear off. What other choice would she have? But that also brought risk, because the spell would wear off for all the fairies, meaning Farah would be in the running again. Fabel versus Farah? She would be back where she'd started. What a mess. She leaned against her closet door. You okay? Bunny asked. She sat at her desk, working on throne work. Fabel was as far from being okay as an ogre was from being charming. Her shoulders were aching, her neck sore. Her wings had always felt weightless, as if spun from air. But now it was like carrying a backpack filled with stones. I'm fine, 
she lied, though the bottoms of her feet throbbed something fierce. Show no weakness. You sure? Bunny pushed her top hat away from her eyes. Her long ears twitched. You don't look fine. I mean, you've got dark circles under your eyes. And you're not complaining about my carrot tops like you usually do. It was true. Faybell's energy level was at a low simmer at best. Her mirror phone rang. Her mother's face appeared on the screen. Darling, I just heard. Madam Baba Yaga assures me that you will be fine. Your wings will recover completely. I'll send the driver immediately to pick you up. Faybell stepped into the hallway so she could speak to her mother in private. Mom, I can't go home. I can't miss classes or I'll fall behind. I have too much work to do. I have villain club, cheer hexers to lead. I'm swamped. Nonsense. Your health is more important than schoolwork. I'll call Headmaster Grimm and demand that you be given special permission to leave. You must recover here, my darling. Healing from dark magic requires special care. Professor Yaga tell you this was dark magic? Fabel asked. I know when dark magic is afoot, she replied. No one needs to inform me of such matters. I am dark magic, as are you, my love. Yes, but you've never been hit by a dark magic spell. Fabel cringed, pained by deep feelings of shame. You never, she couldn't say it, couldn't speak the horrid truth. Fabel looked away. How could she admit that she'd made such an amateur mistake, that she was a victim of her own magic, that she'd paralyzed her own wings? The dark fairy's voice boomed from the speaker. I will demand an inquiry. Someone attacked my child. This will not stand. No, Mom, don't. Fabel looked around to make certain no one was eavesdropping. The only movement was Lizzie Hartz's plump hedgehog waddling between rooms, searching for treats. I don't want you to make a big deal about this. I don't want you to investigate. I'm old enough to fight my own battles. And I'm old enough to clean up my own messes. Her mother looked at her. Though the dark fairy was far away and her face on a small screen, Fabel felt the power of her mother's gaze. Fabel, did you? Her mother paused. Did she suspect the truth? Very well, she said. Fight your battle. But if at any time I sense you need me, I will fly at lightning speed to fight by your side. She blew a kiss. Thanks, Mom. Did other villains have such good relationships with their parents? That might make for an interesting topic of discussion at the next villain club meeting. Back in the room, Spindle yapped at Fabel's feet. She picked him up and nuzzled his cheek. He chewed on her finger, his tail wagging as if charged by its own motor. I'm going to dinner, she told him. I'll bring you back a treat. I can't go. Bunny said, hunched over a hexed book. Could you bring me a salad? What do you think? I'm guessing no. Bunny's ears drooped. I've taught you well. Then she whispered in Spindle's furry ear. But for you, my love, I'll bring back whatever your little heart desires. Now, if only she could get what her heart desired. Chapter 16, A Golden Opportunity. Sunday morning came. Fabel had barely slept a wink. The combination of worry and discomfort had taken its toll. Dressed and headed for breakfast, she walked down staircase after staircase, trying to focus her thoughts. She still wanted to play the wicked fairy queen, She'd put so much time and effort into getting the role, and quitting was never an option. So, it seemed the next thing to do was to remove Cupid from the competition. 
But Fabel would have to manage this without her cheer factor, without any sort of fairy magic. How could she do that? As she entered the Castleteria, students turned to stare, but their eyes were not filled with fear or respect. It was a softer, concerned look. Pity. They felt sorry for her. On a normal day, she would have whacked them with her wings as she flew past. What are you looking at? She snapped at Gus Crumb, son of Gretel. I was not looking at anything, Gus said, his mouth half stuffed with pie. I was looking at nothing. I am not nothing, she corrected. I am still the daughter of the dark fairy. Do not forget that. She raised her voice so that it spread to every pair of ears in the castleteria. This is a momentary inconvenience. My superior flying skills will return. But be forewarned, if you anger me now, you will feel my wrath later. A pair of cleaning fairies bowed their heads respectfully. But Apple White leaped from her bench and hurried to Fabel's side. Oh, you're so good at the whole villain thing, she said, smiling so hard that two perfect dimples appeared on her round cheeks. I wish my villain would take her role more seriously. Anywho, here's a little something for you. Charm you later. And off she went. She'd handed Fabel a card. Fabel opened it. A little birdie told me you were sick. Get well soon. Apple white. Hearts and smiley faces. It was cringeworthy, but also kind of nice. Fabel joined her six cheer hexers at their usual table. Seeing their wings hanging lifeless against their backs was a shocking sight indeed, but they looked different in other ways. They were dressed in drab sweatpants and sweatshirts. No one had bothered to comb hair or gloss lips. And they weren't bickering as usual. They were sitting quietly, barely touching their food. When they saw her coming, they cheered in very quiet voices. Faybell, Faybell, she's the one. She's the one and something, something. Then sighed. They didn't even have the energy to finish the sentence or to rhyme. Why aren't you wearing your uniforms? Fabel asked as she sat. What's the point? Why bother? I'm so depressed. Me too. Fabel glanced around the table. Where's my food? She asked. Her team always got her food and drink, but there was no tray waiting for her. We forgot. Well, I'm here and I'm hungry, so go get me something, Fabel said. You want us to walk all the way over there? The food counter was only a few yards away. Walking so hard. I hate walking. I tried skipping and that's even worse. I can't even cartwheel. My wings throw off my balance. Why did this happen? The six looked to Fabel for an answer. Their leader, their future queen. Fabel grabbed one of their glasses and took a long drink. They were still looking at her, waiting for wisdom. They needed a pep talk. Listen up, she said. We're going to get better. We're going to fly again and do cartwheels and win cheer hexing championships. You can bet on that. But right now, we've got a bigger problem. I need you to hocus focus. She motioned them in for a huddle. I don't want Cupid to get that part. Understand? If I can't play the wicked fairy queen, no one can. So I need Cupid to quit. But it can't look like I made her quit. Got it? No, not really. Are you going to drink all of my juice? Fabel snapped her fingers. Pay attention. How can we get Cupid to quit the play? Oh, I know. You could turn her into a toad. 
or push her into the wishing well so she ends up in Wonderland. Or cast a hiccup spell so she can't say her lines. No, no, no! Fabel groaned with frustration. I can't do any of those things. I can't cast dark magic or they'll know it was me. It needs to look like Cupid made this decision herself. A few of the students at the next table had turned and were staring over their shoulders. Fabel drew her team closer and lowered her voice. We can't talk details here. I'll meet you on the field in 15, and I'll expect some sort of brilliant and devious plan. Go. Walk to the field? That's such a long way. We could call a carriage. I have an app. Oh, good idea. As the cheer hexers dragged themselves from the castle Tyria, Fabel reluctantly got her own breakfast. She helped herself to scrambled goose eggs, country purple potatoes, and a crisp red apple. But she'd only eaten a few bites when a fluttering sound drew her attention. See a Cupid landed, tray in hand. Hi, Fabel. Mind if I join you? Yes. Yes, you mind? Or yes, I can join you. Fabel skewered a potato. What do you think? Oh, great, thanks. Cupid chose the bench across from Fabel. She placed her tray on the table, then sat. Apparently, the little Greek demigoddess was an expert on love, but not sarcasm. She was as pink as always. Even her eyelids had a generous swish of sparkly pink shadow. She'd chosen a Greek yogurt with honey for breakfast. So, I've been thinking about something. Not only was she invading Fabel's personal space, but she also required conversation. If you don't mind, I'm trying to eat, Fabel told her. Me too. Cupid took a bite of yogurt. But the something I've been thinking about is you. I think I have figured it out. Did she suspect the truth? Did she know Fabel had cast the wilted wing spell? Fabel set her fork aside. Do go on. I'm tingling with expectation. You said that dark fairies never get sick, yet here you are, just like the others, with the same illness. But did you know that our immune systems are influenced by our emotions? Sadness, depression, and stress make us more vulnerable to disease. But joy, laughter, and love make us stronger. More feel-good mumbo-jumbo. I've heard enough, Fabel said. You can leave now. But I haven't told you my idea. So not interested. Cupid wasn't discouraged by Fabel's snarky tone. I think the reason you got sick is because you need more love in your life. If you want, I could help make a match for you. Matchmake? Don't you dare shoot me with one of those arrows. She pointed to the golden quiver that hung from Cupid's shoulder. Oh, I'd never do that. I only use my arrows in emergency situations because they are so powerful. Did you know that one of my arrows would make you so loopy you wouldn't be able to think clearly? You'd quit your clubs, stop going to class. You wouldn't want to do anything but pursue love. She giggled. Anyway, I believe you should start with a date. Meet at Hocus Latte. That's a good place to talk. Or do an activity, like go for a... What did you say? Fabel interrupted. I said, do an activity, go for a, no, you said something about quitting clubs. Suddenly, this conversation was taking an interesting turn. Oh, right, well, my arrows are very powerful. Cupid set her quiver and bow onto the table. They contain an ancient Greek god love potion. It changes the chemistry of your brain, so all you can think about is love. It literally makes you lovesick. You don't want to do any of your normal activities. Really? 
I have to be very cautious about using my arrows. You should hear my dad's stories. He caused so much trouble. That's why I like to matchmake the old-fashioned way. Fabel reached out and touched the golden quiver. What happens, exactly? Does the effect take place immediately? Oh, yes, instantly. How long does it last? It can last for a whole week. But then it starts to wear off. If that person was meant to fall in love, they will stay in love. But if it wasn't meant to be, they will have no lingering effects. Greek god magic wasn't fairy magic, which meant that Fabel wouldn't be casting a spell. Could the perfect plan have fallen right into her lap? How can you shoot someone with an arrow and not hurt them? These aren't regular arrows. Cupid took one out and showed it to Fabel. It was small and golden. My arrows dissolve the instant they hit someone. You can't even feel it pierce the skin. I have the worst aim ever after. What if I miss and hit the wrong person? I can't count the number of times I've almost shot myself in the foot. She laughed. Then she slid the arrow back into the quiver. Shooting myself with my own magic. Can you believe that? Fabel glowered at her. You'd have to be totally lame to hit yourself with your own magic. Hey, Cupid, a voice called. Ashlyn and Briar were standing a few yards away. You want to come with us? Ashlyn asked. We're taking breakfast to Farah. She's feeling super sad about her wings. Briar held up a platter. We thought we'd cheer her up with some fairy berry pancakes. The whipped cream jiggled. Oh, I want to help cheer her up too, Cupid called. Bye, she said to Fabel, and she flew after the princesses. Fabel smiled. Her hands closed around the bow and the quiver, which Cupid had left behind. Chapter 17 Twinkle Toes When Fabel arrived at the athletic field, she was surprised to find that the six cheer hexers were not there as instructed. Apparently, the chariot app hadn't worked, so they'd only walked halfway before deciding they were too tired to take another step. So Fabel had to go look for them. She found them draped across benches next to the swan pool. The sun was shining, and the fairies weren't paying any attention to their limp wings. Fabel pulled a travel-sized spray bottle of sunscreen from her pocket. Your wingtips are going to burn, she scolded. She walked around and spritzed each fairy. How could they be so negligent? This wilted wing spell was clearly taking a bigger toll than Fabel had realized. It was wilting more than just the fairy's wings. Did you come up with a plan? She asked, returning the sunblock to her pocket. We're too tired to think. Our feet are killing us. We need jetpacks or something. Yeah, jetpacks. Fabel had never been a fan of complaining. Actions always spoke louder than words. Hello, she said. In case you hadn't noticed, I'm in the exact same condition, and you don't hear me whining. Or confessing that I'm the cause of all this, she silently added. She snapped her fingers, trying to get their full attention. Listen up, I will overlook your total disregard of my instructions this one time, because I have already devised a plan, and it's both brilliant and devious. She opened her shimmering cape to reveal the quiver and bow, which she'd slung over her shoulder. Fabel looked around to make sure no one was within earshot. The only creatures nearby were the swans, and Duchess Swan, who could turn into a swan, was not among them. It appeared the coast was clear. These are Cupid's arrows, Fabel explained. Still, the fairy said nothing. Don't you get it? I'm going to aim one at her foot. Why? Are you taking archery or something? Are you mad at her foot? No, I'm not mad at her foot. 
For fairies, these six were unbelievably daft sometimes. If she gets struck by her arrow, she'll go lovesick crazy, and she won't care about being in the play. She'll only care about love. Get it? She won't go to callbacks this afternoon. She won't get the part. I still think it would be easier to turn her into a toad. It might be easier, but that kind of magic could be traced back to me. Fabel closed her cape again. This plan is brilliant because this is Cupid's magic, not my magic. People will think she shot herself in the foot. It's foolproof. But I need your help. They groaned with exasperation. How could she motivate them? Cupid thinks she's better than us because she can fly and we can't. Fabel waited for those words to sink in. Despite their fatigue, little sparkles ignited in their eyes. We don't like Cupid. No, we don't. She can fly and we can't. That makes us so mad. Let's get her. Yes, let's. And then, with a sudden burst of energy, they cheered, Fabel, Fabel, shish boom ba, shoot Cupid in the foot, ra ra ra. There was nothing like an evil plan to bring the cheer hexers together once again. It didn't take long to find Cupid. She'd already posted signs all over campus about her lost bow and arrows. Lost, a golden bow and quiver of golden arrows. If found, please return to me, Cupid. I'll be down at the stables, feeding Peggy, my Pegasus. Getting to the stable required more walking, but they finally made it. The stable doors stood wide open. Fabel told the cheerhexers to wait beneath a grand oak tree while she surveyed the situation. She crept to the barn and peeked around the doorframe. Cupid was standing in the middle of the barn, brushing a lovely white-winged pony. The pony's ears pricked, and she glanced at Fabel, but Cupid didn't notice. Fabel couldn't have wished for a better location. There was no one around to witness the devious deed, except a pony who couldn't speak. Excellent. Cupid, however, wasn't going to be as easy a target as Fabel had hoped, because as the little demigoddess brushed, she kept moving. She flapped her wings so she could reach the back of the pony's neck. Then she moved to Peggy's rump to brush the tail. Next, she darted toward the front leg. She was flitting around like a pink bumblebee. Fabel hurried back to the cheerhexers, who were now lounging in the oak tree's shade. Okay, she's in there, so here's what we'll do. I need you to go inside and persuade her to take off her shoes. How are we going to do that? Yeah, how? Fabel groaned. Do I have to think of everything? Yep, uh-huh. Wasn't that the truth? Okay, so tell her that you love her shoes and you want to try them on. Or tell her that she stepped in Pegasus poop. Whatever. Just get her barefoot and then distract her so she doesn't see me. Got it? They nodded, and off they trudged in their sweatpants. And because they weren't used to tiptoeing, they made as much noise as a herd of minotaurs. Fabel pulled an arrow from the quiver and held it against the bow. She'd never shot an arrow before, but how difficult could it be? She hurried back to the barn. A stack of hay bales provided the perfect hiding spot. She stepped behind it. The barn housed all sorts of hoofed creatures, so the odor was pungent. Hi, Cupid, the cheerhexer said, their heavy footsteps kicking up bits of straw. Peggy snorted. Cupid stopped brushing and landed on the ground. Her little wings fluttered their welcome. Hi, what are you all doing here? We came to see you. Yep, to see you. Really? Her wings relaxed. Do you need love advice? We want you to take off your shoes. Fabel rolled her eyes. At an upcoming villain club meeting, she'd need to have a discussion about subtlety. My shoes? Cupid looked down at her feet. 
The shoes were pink, of course, decorated with little rhinestone hearts. Do you like them? Love them. Adore them. We don't like you because you can fly. But we think your shoes are spell-tacular. Really? Cupid didn't seem to notice the insult amid all the compliments. I special ordered them from the glass slipper. Would you like to try them? She slipped one off and handed it to the nearest fairy. Cupid's toes twinkled with pink polish. As she reached for another shoe, Faybell smirked with satisfaction. How easy was this? Faybell pulled back the bow and prepared to aim when the sound of approaching footsteps drew everyone's attention. Faybell stepped into the hay bale's shadow as Humphrey Dumpty entered the barn. He stopped dead in his tracks when he spotted the cheer hexers. His round face turned crimson. Humphrey? Cupid asked. You okay? Yes. He gulped, then adjusted his thick glasses. I was looking for you, Cupid. I saw your sign taped to the tree outside the castleteria. Did you find my bow and quiver? She asked, hopefully. No, but I wanted to ask you something, something personal. He fiddled with his suspenders, which held his pants way too high. Sure, this sounds important. She turned to the fairies. Give me a moment, and then we can talk about my shoes. With one foot bare, she led Humphrey over to the stack of hay bales, far enough from the fairies for a private conversation, but close enough so Faybell could hear every word. What's up? You know how I tried out for the forgetful prince? His voice had a squeaky quality. Well, it's the leading male role, and that means daring charming will get it, of course. Why do you think that? Because he always gets the lead. Nobody sees me as a leading man. I'm the tech guy. I'm the nerd. Cupid didn't argue with him. And if everyone sees me that way, then Justine won't be any different. So I was wondering, well, do you think you could help me get girls to take me more seriously? Maybe help me get a date? Try not tucking your sweater vest into your pants, Fabel thought as she peeked around a hay bale. The key, Humphrey, is to be yourself, Cupid said calmly. The right girl will love you for who you are. Yeah, but if you help me get a date, then Justine might see me differently. She might give me the leading role. I know it's a long shot, but I'd like to try. As Cupid listened to Humphrey, she stood perfectly still, her bare foot in view. Fabel pulled back the bow. Ready? Aim? But just as her fingers released, Peggy, the Pegasus pony, lunged forward and knocked it into the bales, throwing Fabel off balance. The arrow soared through the air. Fabel landed on the floor. Whoa, Peggy, what's wrong? Cupid grabbed Peggy's reins. Do you want some hay? Fabel scrambled to her feet. Still hidden, she sneaked a look. Cupid's bare foot looked untouched. Cupid wasn't wearing a goofy, love-struck grin. Fabel had missed her target? Where had the arrow gone? A moment later, that question was answered. Chapter 18. Humphrey the Hunk? Hi, Humphrey. One of the cheer hexers skipped forward and put a hand on Humphrey's arm. My, my, don't you look handsome today, she batted her lashes. I do? Humphrey's crown fell right off his head. Oh, my godmother, Fabel couldn't believe it. The arrow had struck one of her cheer hexers. Fabel's misfortune was at an all-time epic high. Luck had completely abandoned her. Sure, that particular cheer hexer had wilted wings and lovesickness, but that couldn't compare with the humiliation Fabel would feel if she lost the roll to Cupid. She grabbed another arrow and set it against the bow. Stand still, Cupid, she silently urged. Ready? 
aim? Cupid moved, again. What was the matter with her? She was as fidgety as a flea. The arrow soared past Cupid's leg and hit another cheer hexer right in the shin. As the arrow dissolved, a goofy grin spread across the cheer hexer's face. Oh, Humphrey, she cooed. Where have you been all my life? Uh, I've mostly been in the tech club room. We've been recalibrating a pumpkin stagecoach motor. Fabel couldn't believe this was happening. Without even thinking, she grabbed another arrow, narrowed her eyes, and took aim. Cupid moved again. The arrow whizzed past Peggy's tail and hit a third cheer hexer. This one took her arrow in the shoulder. Oh, Humphrey, the latest victim gushed. That sounds so exciting. Can I recalibrate with you? Humphrey was speechless. Three fairies were hanging onto his arms, batting their lashes, and smiling at him. You see, Cupid said happily, I told you, just be yourself. Fabel set down the bow and quiver and took a seat on a bale of hay. It was as if the universe was mocking her. Everything she'd tried to accomplish over the last few days had gone wrong. Would she have to join Raven in the vault of lost tales, looking for a book to help them both with their backfiring spells? Would nothing go right? The three love-struck cheer hexers began bickering. I saw him first. No, I did. He's mine. Because they were so deliriously eager for Humphrey's attention, the other three, who hadn't been struck by arrows, began to wonder why Humphrey had suddenly become such a hot commodity. Why hadn't they noticed this incredibly popular prince? Obviously, he was much more than he seemed. They refused to be left out of this game, so they began to woo him as well. Hi, Humphrey. Don't forget about us. Humphrey, Humphrey, hear our cry. You're the cutest clap, tech guy. They began to push, shove, and elbow, trying to get close to him. What's happening? Humphrey asked with a look of sheer terror. Then chaos erupted. One fairy aimed a spell at another. Horns popped up on that fairy's head. Hey, she aimed back. Take that. A tail sprouted. No, you take that. A nose turned into a snout. I'd better put you in your stall, where you'll be safe, Cupid told Pegasus. I think I've changed my mind about dating, Humphrey said, as fairy dust filled the air. He grabbed his crown and began backing toward the barn door. Fabel might have been annoyed by the cheer hexer's bickering, but they were creating a masterful diversion. Hey, he's getting away. Oh, Humphrey, my love, come back. Humphrey was on the move, running as fast as his skinny legs could carry him. The six cheer hexers, despite their complaints about sore feet, took up the chase, leaving Fabel and Cupid alone in the barn. Finally, Fabel gripped the bow so tightly her fingers went numb. This was her last chance. She'd get it right this time. She stepped out from behind the hay bales. Cupid now stood in the barn's doorway, shielding her eyes and watching the cheer hexers pursue Humphrey up the lane. How strange, Cupid muttered to herself. She wasn't flitting about. Her pink toenail polish twinkled in the sunlight. Fabel took one step, then another. She moved stealthily, like a serpent sneaking up on its prey. She'd get close enough so there'd be no way to miss, not this time. She took aim and Cupid whipped around. Oh, you found them. Her wings beat the air as she dove at Fabel, grabbing the bow and quiver. I'm so relieved to have them back. I don't know what might have happened if they'd fallen into the wrong hands. Thank you so much. She hugged her precious bow and quiver to her chest. Fabel stood in shocked silence. Cupid gave Fabel a concerned look. 
You know, that wilted wing sickness is making your cheer hexers act very odd. You might want to take them to Professor Yaga again. She slipped her shoe back on. I'd better go. I think Humphrey might need my help. Oh, and I also need to get ready for callbacks. Have a great day, and thanks again for finding my stuff. She gave Fabel a happy wave, and off she flew. It was over. There was nothing left to do. Fabel Thorne, daughter of the Dark Fairy, captain of the Cheer Hexing Squad, president of the Villain Club, had failed. She'd hurt herself and her Cheer Hexers. She'd lost. A scream welled up from the depths of her being. She aimed her face toward the barn ceiling and let the scream loose. It erupted, the sound of anguish, waking the sleeping bats and disturbing a family of mice who'd been sitting on a rafter, eating corn kernels. What are you looking at? She grumbled at Peggy, who was chewing on alfalfa. Haven't you ever seen a loser before? Fabel trudged up the lane. Maybe she would go home, lie low, wallow in self-pity. Lost in troubled thoughts, she didn't hear her mirror phone chime its reminder that cheer-hexing practice was about to begin. She didn't even notice that she was walking straight past the field. Hey, Fabel, Hunter ran up to her. Where are you going? Aren't we going to work on the pyramid? Where's the rest of the team? Holly, Nina, and Farah stood by his side, pom-poms in hand, waiting for Fabel's answer. They're not coming, Fabel said. I messed things up, big time. Hunter scratched his head. But I thought you wanted us to get the pyramid perfected for regionals. I do, but how could she explain? She took a deep breath. The other fairies won't be joining us today, or tomorrow. I don't know when they'll be back to normal, when we'll be back to normal. She glanced at Farah. We'll have to forfeit. Hunter, Holly, and Nina gasped. Then with heavy shoulders and drooping wings, Fabel continued walking. Fabel, wait, Farah called. She ran up to her, her uniform skirt beating against her legs. Leave me alone, Fabel snipped. But what are you doing here anyway? I thought you were feeling sad. I am feeling sad, Farah said, matching Fabel's stride. But I didn't want to let you down. I know how much this team means to you. A lump rose in Fabel's throat. Despite the fact that she was stuck with three wingless students, the cheer hexing squad meant everything to her. She was the captain, the leader. But she was also the reason they'd have to forfeit. She'd let them down. It doesn't have to be this way. Farah darted in front of Fabel, blocking her path. You can fix this. Fabel stopped walking. She arched an eyebrow. What do you mean? When I fix things, I make them look better or taste better. They seem better. And it's just a temporary fix until midnight. But you have bigger powers. You can truly fix things. You can make this right. Farah smiled sweetly. What exactly are you insinuating? Look, I know what you think about us good fairies. I know you think our magic is unimportant, but we are very observant. We know the difference between good magic and dark magic. And I know that my wings didn't wilt from some virus. Why didn't she sound angry? What was that tone to her voice? Was it forgiveness? You can clean up this mess, Farah continued. Remember what Madame Baba Yaga told you. She who cleans up her own mess learns to not make it the next time. Though Fabel didn't want to admit it, she couldn't clean up this mess on her own. She needed to swallow her pride. She needed help. Chapter 19 A Dark Confession 
Madame Baba Yaga's office had spent the afternoon running through the enchanted forest, laying eggs, and was now resting on a hilltop above the school. With its chicken legs stretched out, the office snored gently and didn't stir, not even when Faybell knocked on the door. Hello, Faybell. I've been expecting you. The professor was sitting cross-legged on her pillow, floating in front of a crackling fire. Though it was stuffy in the office, she'd wrapped her scarf around her shoulders, and she wore a thick pair of wool socks. Just warming up my old bones, she explained. Come, have a seat. Fabel settled into a big, cushy chair. Despite the numerous patches, stuffing was leaking out. She arranged her cape. She felt ridiculous wearing it, but she still wanted to hide her injured wings. Once settled, she looked around the office. Like most professors, Madame Baba Yaga had an extensive collection of books, but she also had a crystal ball collection and a wall of framed degrees. A thin trail of smoke arose from a bowl of burning incense. Fabel fidgeted. There was no use stalling. She'd come here for a reason. You know everything, don't you? That's why you've been expecting me. I would never profess to knowing everything, but I am aware of certain magical happenings. Madame Baba Yaga motioned with her hand. A kettle that had been sitting on a grate over the fire drifted across the room and began to pour its contents into a mug. Though tea is all the rage on campus these days, I still prefer strong black coffee. Would you like a cup? No, thank you, Fabel fidgeted. It wasn't just the temperature of the room that was making her uncomfortable. It was also a jittery feeling in her stomach. Had coming here been a mistake? Should she leave and never tell anyone the truth? I, I, I'm listening. If I tell you why I'm here, will it go on my student record? The mug floated into Madame Baba Yaga's hand. She took a few sips. Her hoop earrings gleamed in the firelight. Do you want this conversation to be recorded on your student record? No, I don't want anyone to know what happened. I don't want to ruin my reputation. After another sip, the professor set the mug onto her desk, then folded her hands in her lap. Very well. For this meeting, I shall remove my professor hat. She mimicked, taking off a hat and casting it aside. I am no longer acting as your teacher. Whatever you say shall be completely confidential. She paused. Unless, of course, you broke a law. Did you break a law? Fabel shook her head. Excellent. Proceed. There was so much to say. Fabel didn't know how to begin. I made a huge mess, she blurted. Then the whole story poured out. How Justine asked the fairies to audition. How Fabel wanted to play the part. How she went to the vault of lost tales and found the wilted wing spell. How she cheer hexed it, then hit herself with the spell. Then found out that Cupid was also auditioning. How she shot Cupid's arrows and missed. And now her cheer hexing squad was all messed up, so they would have to forfeit their competition and how Cupid would now get the part. This kind of stuff isn't supposed to happen to me. I'm the daughter of the dark fairy. I should be good at dark magic, she sniffled. What was that? Were her eyes filling with tears? She turned away and wiped them with her sleeve. You might be interested to learn that many years ago, a student came to this very office and sat in that very same chair. I don't care about another, Madame Baba Yaga raised her hand. Have patience, Miss Thorne, Fabel sighed. Sorry. As I was saying, this student came to me with a problem. She was auditioning for the lead in the school choir. Wanting to eliminate the competition, she tried to steal her rival's voice. 
but her attempt at dark magic was a failure. The only way she could tell me the truth was to write it on paper. She pointed at a filing cabinet. The third drawer opened, a file rose into the air, then a small slip of paper floated out. It flew toward Fabel, who reached up and grabbed it. Go on, Miss Thorne, read it. Dear Madam Baba Yaga, I made a terrible mistake. I cast a spell, but it bounced off a mirror, and now I've stolen my own voice. Can you help me? Fabel recognized the handwriting. My mother? It wasn't possible. Her mother would never make such a rookie mistake. Everyone knew not to cast spells near mirrors. Do you think you are the only one whose magic has gone awry? Madame Baba Yaga asked. But she's the dark fairy. She is dark magic. She wasn't always the dark fairy. She was once a student, just like you, impatient, self-important, and sometimes overachieving. Fabel's tears had dried. She sat up straight. Hold on, you just said overachieving as if it were some sort of insult. I work hard, what's wrong with that? There is nothing wrong with hard work, but if you try to be the best at everything, you risk becoming the best at nothing. You spread yourself as thin as a fairy wing. Madame Baba Yaga slid off the pillow and walked over to Fabel. President of the villain club, captain of the cheer hexing squad, a full course load, plus you're an honor roll student. And now you want to be a lead in the upcoming theatrical production? Why? It's the wicked fairy queen. I want the whole student body to see me in that role. They already see you in that role, Miss Thorne. Haven't you noticed the way they look at you? She took the paper from Fabel and returned it to the filing cabinet. Once your mother decided to focus on the things that really mattered to her, rather than on the activities she thought would make her seem important, she began to grow. Her magic began to grow. Magic is unpredictable and thus requires great focus. Anything that is worthwhile requires great focus. She closed the cabinet drawer, then turned her attention back to Fabel. Emotions are also unpredictable. Sometimes we can't control them. There is no shame in our emotions. She stared intently at Fabel. Fabel frowned. What are you talking about? What emotions? I understand that you are feeling sorry for yourself. You have wilted wings, and that must be a terrible sensation. But is anything else troubling you? Fabel folded her arms, her expression rigid with defiance. Try to prove I'm feeling something. Go ahead. But there was that lump in her throat again, and that heaviness in her chest. You think I feel bad because I hurt other people? Other fairies? She snorted. I'm a villain. Of course I don't feel bad. If I did, that would mean I'm a total failure. She relaxed her arms a bit. Wouldn't it? Madame Baba Yaga did not respond. I suppose you want me to say that I'm sorry I hurt my cheer hexers. They didn't do anything to deserve wilted wings, and they certainly didn't want to be in love with Humphrey. And I suppose that Farah, who is so nice to everyone, and who makes dreams come true with her magic, Fabel rolled her eyes. I suppose she didn't deserve wilted wings either. And maybe, just maybe, I feel a little bad. And maybe I wish I could go back in time and never cast that spell. But I can't do that. You said no more magic. Still, Madame Baba Yaga said nothing. Fabel leaped to her feet. Holy epic fairy failure. She began to pace. 
what's wrong with me? How can I be a villain if I feel sorry for my victims? There's nothing wrong with you, Madame Baba Yaga assured her. Villain status doesn't mean you are an emotionless robot. On the contrary, fairies feel and sense everything at a deeper level than those without wings. A dark fairy is the most sensitive of all. The professor's old legs creaked as she walked toward Fabel. She clasped both her hands around Fabel's. Savor this lesson, my child. Use dark magic only when absolutely necessary. In this case, it was not needed. You think I would have gotten the role without magic? Madame Baba Yaga nodded. Who better to play a wicked fairy queen than you? Justine knows that. A clock chimed. The office began to tremble as it rose up on its chicken legs. It's time for some exercise, which means we will soon be on the move, Madame Baba Yaga said. Perhaps this is a good time for you to make your exit. Fabel certainly didn't want to get stuck running around the enchanted forest with the professor's weird office. Madam, you said I needed to clean up my own messes. Is there a spell I can use to undo my magic? All dark fairies have the power to undo their magic, but there's a catch. Fabel groaned. What? The spell will work on your victims, but it won't work on you. Your wings will have to recover on their own. I figured you were going to say that. Chapter 20 Pyramid Perfection With special permission from Madame Baba Yaga, Fabel cheerhexed a spell to reverse all the magical chaos she'd created over the last couple of days. She chose to perform it on the athletic field, the one place where a cheer wouldn't raise suspicions. There weren't many students around, just the ever-after-high croquet team, and they were on the far side of the field with their hedgehogs and mallets. Magic, magic, hear my cry, stomp. Dark deeds, dark deeds, say goodbye, stomp. Magic, magic, in your face, clap. Erase it all without a trace, stomp. As the fairy dust cleared, she lowered her pom-poms. There was a long stretch of not knowing. Had it worked? Or had she, the daughter of the dark fairy, once again failed to achieve her magical goals? Then, on the horizon, six figures appeared, in flight. A shiver darted up Fabel's spine, for it was a spelltacular sight to behold. But alas, even as the six fairies soared and dipped, her own wings hung against her back, as wilted as forgotten flowers. Our wings work, they exclaimed as they landed beside her. They began to bounce up and down like, well, like cheer hexers. But weren't we chasing someone? I'm not sure. You were chasing Humphrey. We were? Oh my God, mother, how embarrassing. These were all good signs. Not only did their wings work, but they'd also clearly gotten over Humphrey. No lovesickness meant they were no longer under a spell and would be ready to practice. Things could get back to normal. Except for Fabel, who was still under a curse. But there was no time to wallow in self-pity. She hexed the team for an emergency practice session. Hurry up, she called as Hunter, Nina, and Holly ran onto the field. What took you so long? I was getting a trim at the tower salon, Holly said, though this wasn't obvious because her hair still hung to her knees. Nina was carrying an armful of books. I was studying for my environmental magic exam, she explained. An ax was slung over Hunter's brawny shoulder. And I was chopping wood for Hagatha's new wood-fired pizza oven. Because Fabel couldn't hover, she stepped up onto a bench to ensure that her teammates could see her. 
The team is back to normal, so we don't have to forfeit after all. I think we can still master the inverted pyramid, but we have to make up for lost time. She put her hands on her hips. Where's Farah? Here I am. Half flying, half skipping, the blue-haired fairy waved as she approached. My wings are back to normal. They're not sick anymore. Justine is going to let me audition. Though this did not surprise Fabel, it still stung. So much effort for what? That's great, Holly and Nina said as they hugged her. But when Farah looked at Fabel, her smile vanished. What about your wings? Farah asked. Fabel untied the cape and let it fall onto the bench. She didn't need to hide her wings. The fact that they still hung lifeless was as clear as the ever after high sky. Despite her condition, she'd muster some pride. Apparently, dark fairies have such a complex wing structure, it takes longer for them to heal. She raised an eyebrow, daring anyone to argue with that obvious fact. No one did. She clapped her hands. Okay, enough chit chat. We have work to do. Let's practice our cheer for regionals. Everyone grabbed pom poms. Then, chanting the cheer Fabel had written, they performed their pivots, turns, and kicks in perfect sync. Spell, say what, say what, spell. That's what we do. We spell. We spell for you. The final grand move, the one that would blow the audience away, was the inverted pyramid. At least, that was the plan. With looks of trepidation, Hunter took his place. Then, with a boost from the rest of the team, Holly and Nina balanced on Hunter's shoulders, forming the second row. Looking good, Fabel said. Next row. Two of the fairies flew and landed carefully on the outside shoulders of the second row. Farah then flew and landed gently, one foot on Nina's inside shoulder, one foot on Holly's inside shoulder. There was some wobbling. She's stepping on my hair, Holly complained. Steady, Fabel said. Focus. One of the fairies elbowed Farah. Hocus, focus. How are you doing, Hunter? His face was turning red. I'm okay. Just hurry it up. I can't do this much longer. As soon as the three rows were steady, she called for the next row. The last four fairies took to the air, then gently landed on the shoulders of the third row. Farah's knees buckled, but only for a moment. Nina began to sag. Fabel clenched her jaw. They were so close. Fabel held her breath. The pyramid teetered to the right, then the left. Whoa, Hunter moaned. I can't hold on any longer, Nina warned. Anything that is worthwhile requires great focus, Fabel told them, quoting her wise old professor. Close your eyes and think of nothing but this pyramid. As her team followed their captain's instructions, the inverted pyramid took its perfect upside-down shape. Fabel gave them a standing ovation. The trophy would be theirs. One by one, the fairies alighted, and the team gathered for a group cheer. Stomp, 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 stomp your feet. Ever after high clap can't be beat. Chapter 21, Curtain Call. As the curtain closed and the applause faded, Fabel made sure she wasn't smiling. She wanted to look as bored as possible. That had definitely been the strangest play she'd ever seen. Justine was an amazing choreographer, but her casting choices went totally against the grain. In the role of the forgetful prince, dashing and dim-witted, she'd cast Humphrey Dumpty, who was one of the smartest students at school. In the role of the melancholy princess, gloomy and whiny, she'd cast Ashlyn Ella, who was always smiling and happy. And for the wicked fairy queen, brooding and evil, 
she'd cast Farah Good Fairy, who was as twinkly and kind as a fairy could be. Hello, talk about an insult to dark fairies everywhere. But despite the unusual casting decisions, the play had been entertaining. Especially Humphrey's fight scene. He'd tripped over his own feet and almost impaled himself on his own stage sword. Having impaled herself with her own magic, Fabel knew exactly how Humphrey felt. But the music had been good, and there'd been quite a few laughs. Cupid had landed a part in the chorus and had ended up with a mini solo. Wake up, Fabel told her cheer hexers. All six of them had fallen asleep in the middle of the melancholy princess's monologue. It's over. You would have been so much better, one of them said with a yawn. So much better. That little good fairy stank. Stank up the whole stage. Stop pushing me. You stop pushing me. Many of the actors, still in costume, were gathering in the lobby to greet family and friends who'd come to the show. Fabel meant to walk straight through, but an all too familiar voice called her name. She turned to find Farah beaming at her. Farah wore a black wig, but a few strands of blue hair peeked out. What did you think? Farah asked. The grin on her face was huge, and her cheeks were flushed. Fabel narrowed her eyes. What did I think about what? About the play, of course. She shrugged. It was boring, said one of the fairies. So boring. It made me fall asleep. Me too. Oh, is that Humphrey? Hi, Humphrey. Fabel raised a hand to quiet them. The play was better than I expected, she said. If the good fairy wanted a bigger compliment than that, she'd have to stand there until Wonderland froze over. Oh, that's so nice to hear, Farah said. Then her smile faded. But the only reason I got the part was because your wings didn't heal in time. I feel so badly about that. Fabel didn't want to have this conversation. There was no time in her schedule to dwell on what might have been. Look, you did fine. Even if my wings had healed in time, I'd already decided that I needed to cut back on my activities and focus on the things that are most important to me. Acting isn't one of those things. That sounds like a smart plan. Farah's blue eyes twinkled. She stepped closer and lowered her voice. But you and I both know the wicked fairy queen should have been your part. The six fairies waited for Fabel's response. Everyone in earshot turned and watched. Fabel's wings shuddered. Of course the part should have been hers, but that was in the past. Fabel was determined to be the sort of fairy who looked to the future. She wasn't going to fret about the fact that she'd messed up. After all, another very famous dark fairy had made youthful mistakes too, and she'd turned out amazing. And Fabel had also decided that she wasn't going to worry so much about whether everyone saw her the way she wanted them to see her. Her destiny had been decided, and she'd claim it when the time was right. Farah was still looking at her. I'm sorry you didn't get the part. Sorry? Fabel threw back her head and laughed as deviously as she could. Don't worry your pretty little self about me, Farah, good fairy. I get to play the part of the wicked fairy queen for the rest of my life. With dramatic flair, Fabel unfurled her magnificent wings. The six cheer hexers cheered. Everyone stepped aside. Was that fear she saw in a few eyes? How delightful. Then she flew from the lobby, and the air embraced her once again. Regional champions, Ever After High cheer hexers, led to victory by team captain Faybell Thorne.
This has been a Hachette audio production of Ever After High, Fairies Got Talent, a school story. Written by Suzanne Selfors. Read by Kathleen McInerney. Produced and directed by Dennis Ko. Audio edited by Jennifer Nix. Mixing and mastering by Jeremy Wesley. Production supervised by Christine M. Farrell. Ever After High, Fairies Got Talent is also available in print and digital formats from Little Brown and Company, a division of Hachette Book Group. For more Hachette Audio productions, visit us at hachetteaudio.com. Thank you for listening. Text copyright 2015 by Mattel Inc. Audio production copyright 2015, Hachette Audio. All rights reserved. In accordance with the U.S. Copyright Act of 1976, the duplicating, uploading, and electronic sharing of any part of this audiobook without the permission of the publisher constitutes unlawful piracy and theft of the author's intellectual property. If you would like to use material from the audiobook, other than for review purposes, prior written permission must be obtained by contacting the publisher at permissions at hbgusa.com. Thank you for your support of the author's rights. This audiobook is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are either the product of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, events or locales, is entirely coincidental.